Um, I think we should probably kick off. Um, I'm sure more people will join the call um, as we get going. So welcome everyone uh, to this event on geopolitics and urbanization in Africa, organized in collaboration between the African Center for Cities and the Great Powers and Urbanization Project. I'm Andy Tucker, the Deputy Director at the African Center for Cities. Before I hand over to Ian for introductory remarks, I'd just like to offer um, some brief housekeeping rules. First, since the event is running as an open Zoom meeting, please can I ask those who are not speaking to mute their microphones. Uh, we will also have time for discussion and questions from the audience after all the speakers have spoken in their session. During the discussion session, we'll first ask the speakers if they have any questions or comments for each other before opening up to the audience for questions. Can I please ask audience members who would like to ask a question verbally to use the blue raise hand function by your name in the participant list during the discussion sessions. Audience members are also welcome to put the questions in the chat function. Also, just to let you know, we'll be recording this event. Uh, many partners in this project in collaboration are uh, from different parts of the globe and time zones means it's effective if we can record and share for some. Okay, so now over to Ian Klaus, who is a senior fellow on global cities at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and the driving force behind the Great Powers and Urbanization Project, and who is also offering this introduction at Gone Midnight His Time. So thank you and uh, over to Ian. Yeah, thanks very much, Andy. Uh, you're right. I was secretly hoping that we would start um, just a couple minutes early so that I could say both good evening and good morning um, on, on both sides of the opening and closing of just five minutes of, of hellos. Um, and, but I'm not going to feel sorry for myself because I do see some colleagues from uh, Philadelphia uh, also joining us from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I think for them, it, it is an even more difficult hour. Um, so I, I feel fortunate as it, as it were. Um, uh, as, as you mentioned, this, this workshop is part of a series undertaken by the Great Powers and Urbanization Project, a collaboration of six think tanks and universities. Over the course of the early 21st century, global economic and demographic trends have increased the relative importance of urban spaces, while cities themselves have organized collectively in the face of transnational challenges. But while, while urban populations, areas, and economies expand, and mayors continue their move into the international arena, that arena itself has been shifting. These two developments, the return of geopolitics, if not great power politics, and continuing urbanization, needn't always be addressed as separate phenomena of the project asserts. Cities have become the economic engines and sites of innovation for nation states, as well as targets for surveillance and cyber attacks for national governments. Successful powers in the 21st century will build stable and innovative cities at home while projecting influence and times military strength in urban settings abroad. Indeed, I would flag a recent publication by the National in Intelligence Council of the United States, Global Trends 2040, the flagship public facing publication of the US intelligence community uh, uh, for its focus, unprecedented really, uh, on urban issues and cities, both their role at the forefront of policymaking, but also the roles they might play given the collapse of trust in national governments. And I don't wanna burden Andy with the weight of the parallel, but weeks after he, during a Buenos Aires um, convening, made the observation that the health and equity of South African cities influences the regional and global standing of the nation state, President Biden, framed his domestic infrastructure plan in terms of geopolitical competition. That said, most conversations about the return of great power politics ignore urban dynamics, dismissing references to urbanization or city-focused efforts as naively post-Westphalian. Meanwhile, many urban debates focus as they are on urban dynamics such as planning, public space, and service delivery. Proceed with little time for geopolitical trends at the nation state level. International relations scholars and urbanists, as well as diplomats and mayors, still often operate in worlds apart. This project was launched in part to bring those conversations together, knowing one, that wouldn't always feel natural or easy, 
and two, that regional approaches would be crucial. The first workshop, Cities, Geopolitics, and the International Legal Order, was hosted by the University of Pennsylvania's Perry World House and examined the relationship between the sovereign territorial nation state and the city as a space and a political actor. The second workshop, From Multilateralism to Multistakeholderism, was hosted by the Barcelona Center on International Affairs. I see colleagues are joining us uh, today. And focused on the development of new transnational governance approaches including the role of cities in European regional governance. The most recent workshop hosted by the Argentine Council on International Relations considered urban issues in Latin America in the context of COVID-19 and associated public health diplomacy efforts. Two more will soon follow hosted by the University of Melbourne's Connected Cities Lab and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs respectively. But this morning, of course, it's incredibly exciting to be here virtually. Uh, for the African Center and Cities workshop for a number of reasons. First, the reader always bears the blame, I think, but Edgar's co-authored book, New Urban Worlds, and the way it moves back and forth between the universal and the particular, between the global, the regional, and the local. And in its advocation, the values of experimentation was an inspiration for this project. And I must confess, I was incredibly excited when I saw on the agenda a title that included the words with imagination and international institutions. It's a first for me. Um, it's also very exciting to be here because the agenda in, in the ACC team put together has direct line of sight, um, an IC, IPCC term I'm sure uh, Anton is familiar with that I now hear all the time, but it makes me as a historian a bit uneasy, to previous convenings. The discussion of national urban policies may find comparative material in Jeannie Birch's interventions during the Penn gathering. While well, the focus on international organizations and health connects to conversations in Philadelphia, Barcelona, and Buenos Aires, both before and after the pandemic's arrival, around international organizations and global and regional health regimes. And having read part of Andy's previous and developing work on PEPFAR, the exploration of the intersection of diplomacy and development and informality tracks strongly with Michael Cohen and Patricia Barragon's discussion of Latin American cities in this context. Perhaps, though, those lines of sight are not so clear. I kind of hope so. Today, we are in a different context on a different continent. And speaking for myself, but I think of all the partners as well, I'd really just like to thank at the outset, Edgar, Andy, Alma, and the whole team at the African Center for Cities for bringing us together to continue the conversation. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Ian. Thank you for those really uh, generous, pertinent, and uh, important uh, remarks. Um, we'll now go straight into the first session um, uh, on the possibilities for regional innovation and the future of cities. As we proceed, we'll be posting links to more detailed bios on each speaker in the chat function, if you'd like to find out more about us. So to begin, and in a slight change to the advertised program, we first have Geshi Karuri Sabina, who is an associate of the South African Cities Network, visiting research fellow with the Witt School of Governance and adjunct professor at the African Center for Cities, who will be speaking on the topic of decolonizing African urban futures, reframing imaginations and tensions across global and local institutions. Over to Geshi. Uh, good morning, Andy, and good morning, everybody, and thanks for that uh, introduction. Um, so yes, um, I, I was invited to comment on uh, the future of African cities in relation to this conversation about um, the geopolitics that, that Ian was speaking about and these global powers. And what we thought seemed relevant to question in relation to the work that I've been doing uh, is where or how these international structures and you know, approaches, the development partners, the various global uh, urban associations and platforms, you know, how they intersect with uh, at least my experience of local urban development issues uh, in Africa uh, uh, more generally. Uh, and I thought I could do that in two segments. So first I wanted to share what I believe to be some of the questions or issues around the future of African cities and urban issue as I understand it. Uh, and then second, hopefully to uh, connect back uh, uh, to these institutional questions uh, uh, and how I see that intersection with global power and, and, and partners. So, so I hope that will be helpful. 
Um, sorry. Uh, I, I hope that will be helpful. So I'm just going to share screen here uh, um, and hope that that works okay. So I've been involved for quite some time in this space of thinking about or being asked to think about often uh, the future of the African city. And uh, it's often an interesting uh, uh, question uh, in the way it's framed in the first place. You know, uh, often it's framed from the perspective that, well, first of all, it's framed as though it's a question that has an answer. So I'm going to now tell everybody what the future of the African city is, and that itself is interesting. Um, but also it's often in the pursuit of the application of some prevailing ideas about what cityness means uh, and what the future means or is in our context. Um, uh, however, that idea that there is a path, there is a thing called cityness we aspire to, there is a form of urbanization that is sustainable for Africa and ought to be pursued, is a path that even globally, I would say, uh, and now perhaps accentuated, accelerated by COVID, uh, you know, isn't leading anywhere. So there is at least for some of us an appreciation that there's a great need to rethink development, to rethink cities, to rethink some of the anticipatory assumptions we've had about the future. Uh, and I raise all of this because these ideas about cityness and about future uh, aren't just you know, an academic issue. They are ideas that have really taken, um, and I've maybe even say captured, the imaginary of a lot of the politicians who lead development uh, um, uh, are propagated, I think, by many of the practitioners that visualize uh, these forms of development uh, that inform a lot of the capital that supports uh, uh, this development. So uh, in our space in South Africa, for example, you know, when we have really powerful statements made uh, about you know, the urban solution uh, really being about um, the smart city and, and, and our failure to uh, really capitalize upon that and the desire to invest time and resource into creating these kinds of imaginary, they seem somehow to ignore or contradict uh, a different reality that uh, uh, many of us uh, are, are painfully aware of. Uh, and, and, and really how these speak to each other is, 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 is a question. Um, and so one begins to realize that we've been pursuing uh, you know, this idea of visioning and, and, and obsessing about what the future African city is in a way that perhaps simply maybe you know, takes us from one fishbowl uh, into the next, so to speak. So if we accept, or if we believe that there is this imaginary, there is this idea, there is this agenda that in fact has, has really enraptured and I think captured a lot of the thinking about what the need is, what the charge is, what needs to happen uh, to deal with uh, African urbanization. Uh, and when we believe that that road isn't taking us somewhere, it really then opens up the question, what next, what are you offering to replace if you want that myth. Uh, and this is the space where I at least have been suggesting that uh, it is a question of imagination, it is a question of process, and it is a question of institutions. And I think that last place is where I'll come back to this uh, a question of how we intersect uh, uh, with international play and actors. So I'll go through each of these uh, individually. So I start by asking this question of how we imagine or, or think about new things. And this really is about a colonization of imagination. Uh, and we hear people talking about poverty of imagination, but I think there's a difference between poverty and, and, and really it being captured. Um, and in this space, uh, and for each of these, I'll use maybe an example from the work or thinking that I've been doing, uh, is, is a question about, you know, what is cityness? What, what, what is city? What do we believe that to be? Uh, and really beginning to understand that um, often what people are asking for and what people want is what they've seen, but in, in a strange sort of way, not necessarily what they've seen in the, in the reality, which probably looks more like what you're seeing here, but in these representations of future of city and what city looks like, the futuristic city that all of you have seen, I won't even bother to show it. Uh, and increasingly we're concerned about the role of technology in that and how we become smart. So I think for me in this space, decolonizing the future becomes a question of how we rethink or we redefine this challenge, uh, how we deeply consider whose lens is used in talking about the future of the city, how that lens is applied, what capabilities and oppressive frames constrain us from imagining what is right in front of us, uh, being the space or being generative in terms of creating authentic space that can actually be enriched by endogenous knowledge, endogenous practice, endogenous experience, and real need uh, uh, that sort of surrounds us. Uh, and some of the plays we've been doing on this are just, again, like I said, these questions of asking about 
what's the lens, who's looking at this space. So when we create these sterile spaces that don't really speak to context, uh, what is it that one can begin to do to create different starting points for questions of imagination, but also really beginning to remove some of those uh, barriers and boundaries to imagining uh, what's possible uh, in, in, in rather oppressive and perhaps unuseful spaces that we've created. So, so that's one of the questions. The second shift we've argued for is a shift around inclusion. So again, you know, there is this idea that um, we can create solutions for the billions, you know, while the billions sit around and I suppose wait for a, a few to do that. Uh, we talk about participation, but many of us are really aware of the challenges of that. In the, in, our last South African State of the Cities report, uh, William Gumede, I think, indicated quite powerfully this idea that we began to obsess with, uh, if you want, the forms of, of, of governance and, 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 and process and not so much its substance and outcomes and, and really whether it includes in the process of pursuing inclusion. Uh, and these are the questions we begin to ask there. And we began to experiment. And, and there are many of these experiments around the, the continent. You know, some of them are very local, some of them are very small. But experiments that begin to ask how participants, how communities, sorry, can be more actively engaged, not just in kind of ceremonial uh, uh, um, um, exercises or pilot projects, but really beginning to contribute to different starting points uh, and, and different kinds of processes that begin to imagine what forms, uh, what functions their cities could serve, their spaces could be different from what they have right now, and what different questions they actually begin to uh, ask about space, but also about their own agency and role uh, in this development. So, so, so this for us becomes a really important uh, a starting point in saying, you know, who are we asking? Uh, are we uh, experimenting and enabling uh, enough of uh, a shift uh, uh, in terms of how we can lead to the value rather than just the form of space, uh, uh, um, the means, not only the ends, uh, as mattering. And, and these aren't new things I'm saying, but I, I think what's been very obvious in how we've done development in the continent and how we imagine urban solutions, uh, it's really not successfully effectively at, uh, achieved this. Uh, and then the last shift, I think perhaps is the most relevant one to the conversation we're having, is really this question of how we actually do new things. Um, so even if we could imagine things being different, even if we could uh, create processes that were more enabling, that were more empowering, uh, there's always this risk for to come up against the same old institutions that want to do things in the same old ways, using the same old tools and processes and check boxes and all of that. Uh, and, and I think this is probably really where the challenge remains because in many African countries, in many African cities, and in many international relationships that we hold, uh, I think what we begin to see is a lot of conventional wisdom, uh, a lot of, in a way, uh, uh, um, seeking to convince people uh, and to convince institutions that the form matters more than its effectiveness. I, I was interestingly uh, involved in an exercise a few months ago where a question was raised to the group uh, about what were the most important things uh, about development and uh, in the final ranking, accountability and transparency ranked higher than whether there had been any effective change, because whether there'd been any effectiveness in the process. And, and nobody thought this was curious and it, it sort of provoked people to look at that a little bit because I, I found that quite curious. So we are more concerned with whether there's good governance, meaning that we're able to check the boxes to say that we were transparent. And I'm not saying these things are not important, but we seem to think that that's more important than whether we actually achieved anything at all. And, and I find that to be a very curious condition that I think is about institutions. I think it's about what is emphasized as being important. Uh, I think it's about some, and maybe that's not the best example, but I think it was one example of where I feel as though sometimes in many of these global partnerships, what has began to happen is a focus on uh, on, on the development solution, on the generic package, on the principles of what's important and universal supposedly, uh, and that's pre-packaged. And that somehow trumps the question about whether it's working and whether that matters. Uh, in South Africa, we've seen real consequences of this uh, in the proliferation of bus rapid transit systems that in that case, I would say was some sort of a, maybe you could even say collusion between national and global ideas and imaginaries and interests uh, uh, imposed upon cities, 
who then didn't have the might or the fiscal strength to argue against that uh, and really rolled out systems that many question uh, uh, to this day. We've had massive uh, programs, again, very much driven by international ideas about what the development agenda ought to include. Uh, and then seeing those fall away, uh, 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 probably not soon enough, you know, after they've distracted and consumed a lot of energy and effort. Uh, a lot of platforms that become more about check boxes and optics uh, and claims of inclusion and impact with very little traction in actually shifting systems and futures on the ground uh, and seeing how little those are challenged, uh, but yet failing to create a richer space to experiment and try anything different. And so in these various global touch points we have, and those are touch points with traditional development partners, you know, be it the multilaterals, the DFIs, uh, those are touch points with many uh, uh, bilateral and other programs that have a firm urban interest. So they, um, you know, we've got programs from the UK with the uh, Future Cities Africa, we've got French programs, German programs, we've got innovation and startup programs, there are many associations driving various agendas. And I'm not critiquing these to say that they're all wrong, uh, but I do, think that there is this questioning that has to happen about how those intersect more meaningfully with local conditions rather than in a way distracting and diverting, sometimes obscuring and occluding uh, what appears to be uh, uh, sensible locally. Um, I wanted to come back to perhaps some of these questions about future cities in you know, the future of urbanization in Africa and some of the dominant narratives. So the smart city has been one and there've been some interesting programs around this. Uh, this is an excerpt from a piece that Judy Black, uh, Backhouse and I worked on in really trying to think about how do we take on some of these very global ideas of what's important, uh, but really consider them in a much more contextualized way that allows us to ask the questions that we feel really need to be asked. So in a way, trying to reframe uh, uh, some of the questionings that some of you know, the city mayors and the city uh, uh, planners uh, and the city uh, innovation units you know, would be driving for in terms of talking about, you know, how do we become smarter? And then there's some good work actually happening, I think that's quite critical in asking for a different reference point and beginning to think about how that reflects institutionally then, you know, what is the role of national governments? What is the role of local government? What, what are the roles of communities in imagining what a smart city is, if that's an important future direction? But we can't ignore in that, I think, this question of the international roles because a lot of the ideas, you know, and there are these ideas of policy circulation and, and, and how those impact upon local thinking and imaginaries. Uh, I, I think that's a, that, that's, that's a question that really has to be asked and centered uh, in these conversations because otherwise, I mean, I can say from a local perspective, one gets the feeling that you're sitting there with uh, a team of city leaders from any African city, but in a way you're speaking, um, you know, in a way you're speaking against a tsunami of ideas coming from elsewhere that appear to have the answer, that appear to have the solution, that appear to frame something that looks nicely packaged and convenient and can simply be implemented, but that really ignores a lot of what probably needs to really be thought about and worked out locally that doesn't go away just because you decided to be smart you know, and, and somebody's offering you that package. So a lot of what we've seen as the take up, I think of some really foolhardy ideas about whether it's the future of cities or creating satellite cities and ignoring the poor and a lot of the issues that many good planners and thinkers and local actors have argued for, I think really do sometimes come out of this um, sort of, you know, back of the pocket ideas that, 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 that get handed over through some of these international collaborations. And I think it's really important to be very, very conscious, I think, and concerned about that. Uh, I introduced the language of decolonization, probably partly to be provocative, but also because I think it's it's, it's really central in, in, in why these issues matter. Uh, and this is just a sort of a framework that we've been working on uh, in this project where we talk about, you know, if we're concerned from a research perspective, you know, this is uh, around not just issues of political societal colonization, but actually these instrumental and procedural ways in which colonization gets, you know, promulgated and also uh, how the intellectual uh, institutional aspects of colonization play out in our countries. And there really is a need to intervene into that. And that intervention has to include not just academic rejection that's began to happen, I think, in many spaces, but also addressing some of the methodological issues, some of the knowledge issues, some of the uh, instrumental issues uh, in how development happens and how we think about space. And I think this raises a lot of questions. So this is more research frame and it speaks to how we approach 
uh, research and knowledge building. But I think it's probably as relevant to ask how this intersects with institutional relationships and global partnerships. Uh, because otherwise, I think we do remain in a muddle where it's very difficult to call some of these things. And in particular, I, I think I just wanted to raise a few points about, uh, I, I suppose, power uh, and these international partnerships that we have, where I think we fail sometimes to acknowledge that institutionally, I can I appreciate the position sometimes of a country or even a mayor uh, when they're faced with uh, a well-meaning and perhaps even you know, quite a valid uh, uh, international directive around something like addressing the future of your city or addressing urbanization in Africa. First of all, sometimes it's simply impolite to say, no, I don't think you've got it, or I don't think what you're saying is terribly important. So there's a politeness issue that affects these international relationships. There's the obvious power issues where you can't always say no. Institutionals have, institutions, I think, have their own political and admin issues, I think, within them as well. So I've seen situations where even within the institution of the global partner, uh, uh, the local, if you want, officials uh, can see that there's something that needs to change, but can't even within their own inst international institution argue for change. So I think power, whether it's between power between the international body and the local or power within the institution itself, uh, I think uh, uh, really become important factors. I've argued, uh, I think, around the tidiness, the need for these clear answers, straight frames, you know, coherent uh, arguments, uh, uh, arguments for accountability, the complexity becomes too much to deal with, the messiness becomes problematic. I think there's a big issue around justification where we often have institutions that are needing to sell their own capacity and knowledge rather than perhaps imagining a role that has to do with augmenting local knowledge uh, and, and perhaps admitting that one isn't coming in with an answer. Uh, the capacity asymmetries matter. So I think we've got many, many instances where the local, uh, maybe sometimes practitioners, sometimes the local officials, the local politicians don't necessarily have the knowledge or capacity to have a, a, an active debate about whether what you're saying or offering is relevant or useful. And I think that's something that can't be ignored. I think often there's this feeling that anything is better than nothing. And so often when, and maybe that's a bit of a power issue as well, that when you're really at your wit's end for what to do and somebody's offering something you're uncertain of, it, it, it seems sensible to take it. Uh, and then of course, the issue of uncertainty, you aren't sure that if you don't do this um, or if you do this, you know, you really don't know either way. So I, I, I think the tendency to then accept uh, what is offered in ways that really do begin to colonize the future uh, in very clear ways. So, so I wanted to end off with, uh, with, 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 with actually this frame. And I hope there's some, I'm, I'm sort of combining a few different ideas here and I hope there's, they're coming off coherently at all. I'm actually glad that Edgar is going after me so that maybe he can help make some sense of all of this. Um, but I wanted to argue uh, that if, you know, the, the, the question of the future is as much about our anticipatory systems, you know, how we think about the future and our assumptions about it, as well as what we think the purpose of doing that is, you know, how we, you know, why we're using the future whether we're using it uh, to try and dominate and control it because we think we can, or whether we believe we're contending with something that's more emergent. Uh, and so this is a frame that uh, a colleague Leo Miller has used uh, in speaking about this. You know, do you see the future as being fairly conventional, things you can imagine you have seen before or quite unprecedented? So that's your X axis. On your Y axis, do you imagine continuity or do you imagine discontinuity? Because they're different orientations and they're not mutually exclusive, but they are different depending on how you understand the future. If it's continuous and conventional, then the language of reform, which many you know, MLIs and DFIs use, probably makes sense that we can seek solutions to problems we've seen before, uh, and we can bring the change uh, and, and deal with that complexity quite internally. However, if we imagine on you know, uh, different possibilities, then there are retrofit or transition strategies, which have become quite popular, I think, in the way we speak about and see things that either have to do with uh, uh, valorizing the past, you know, so doing some experiments, uh, but really thinking that there is some control uh, uh, that we can sort of impose on that, uh, or this idea of transition that we need to adapt to something that perhaps we haven't seen before, uh, but again, in, 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 in you know, using old systems. So the institutions we have pretty much can deal with these issues. You know, or we go into this other space where we uh, perhaps begin to say that uh, we may need to really innovate uh, which may include doing or not doing, uh, which really talks about surfing rather than managing complexity because we're in the space of discovery. Uh, 
of having to create. Uh, and the reason I share this is to say that um, I think these orientations matter from the perspective of what the role of an international partner uh, or an external influence or uh, um, uh, an external interest becomes in your space because what they're doing and what they're offering if it's about, in my view, uh, you know, transition or uh, reform or retrofit, uh, perhaps becomes something that's more straightforward in terms of them bringing in uh, um, external skill, external knowledge, external experience. But if we are in the space of discovery and creation, and my argument would be that in the case of African cities and imagining their futures now, if ever before, uh, really is in this sort of more uncharted space, then, then what is it one is bringing? And, and then it has to be in the space of co-creating co or co-imagining or understanding that what you're bringing maybe is capability, but not an agenda, not a solution, not an answer, not something we've seen before. Uh, and I think that really in a way reframes uh, uh, the question of how these global partnerships could be useful or, or seem to be useful uh, in our context. So I think that's what I wanted to share in terms of uh, what was asked to me uh, uh, in relation to these geopolitics, because, um, yeah, I, I think, in fact, let me stop there, Andy, because I think Edgar will go into some specific ideas. But just on a conceptual level, I think those are the issues that have bothered me a little bit in thinking about the future of African cities uh, and how that intersects, in my view, problematically with how we relate internationally, uh, but how that perhaps could also be reframed in more useful ways. Thank you so much, Geshe, for that really excellent way to kick off the discussions um, uh, today. Um, we'll now move straight on to our second speaker, um, Edgar Peterser, the South African Research Chair in Urban Policy and Director and Founding Member of the African Centre for Cities and my boss, who will be speaking on the topic of the possibilities and imperatives for regional urban innovation platforms. Thanks. Over to Edgar. Thank you, Andy. Um, and I'll hold you to that being a boss part. Um, so um, yeah, so I'm, I'm a bit under the weather. So my apologies if uh, the, this input is going to be a little slurred and, um, and, uh, and, and not as uh, expansive as it potentially could have been. Um, so in preparing my remarks, I realize that actually I'm in the middle of working on a, a, a thought piece for the Gauteng City Region Observatory, which is meant to reflect on um, what the role of city regions are in Africa with a specific reference to the Gauteng City Region. And for our colleagues who are not from South Africa, this is the, the region, the province in South Africa where Johannesburg is located and Tswane or Pretoria and another metropolitan authority called Ikuruleni, where, where, the, the, where the international airport is. is. And um, so, so I'm not gonna talk about, you know, the sort of obvious things to talk about, which are very important, um, but I wanted to use this opportunity to, to I guess, um, explore certain ideas that are still very, very um, initial and provisional, and that has to sort of work itself into a, a more structured paper over the next couple of months. Um, so I'm not going to talk about policy networks. I'm not talking about UCLG Africa. I'm not talking about the various instruments at a pan-African level that is interfacing with the African Union to move the urban agenda forward. Um, I'm not talking about um, policy networks like C40 or ICLE or any of these things that have undoubtedly very important geopolitical um, weight and significance in terms of the voice of cities and how the agenda of the urban is framed uh, on the continent. So I wanna take a slightly different tack and it builds really, I think elegantly on the provocation that we got from Geshe. And, um, and I want to talk about the way in which city regions can come into their own in the African context by really being the, the sort of primary platforms for, for research and development uh, in terms of the green uh, economy agenda that has been embraced as a policy frame or policy discourse at a pan-African level, but to spatialize that. Um, and that is missing from the debates. And I think the unique contribution that cities and particularly economically powerful city regions can bring to the table 
is to substantiate a very broad and unspecified policy commitment in the context of the emergence of a free trade area um, that has just kicked into effect uh, in the beginning of this year. So I don't, I don't want to spend too much time, but I think it is important, obviously, to um, just remind ourselves of just what the context is that we're dealing with. Um, so, you know, so the um, uh, urbanization is, is just at the highest rate in the African context, um, uh, very different uh, levels of urbanization in the different uh, sort of geographical regions of the continent. So North Africa, Southern Africa, pretty much past the tipping point have kind of plateaued. Um, has got fairly modest urbanization rates now, and therefore we don't see that much uh, sort of robust growth over the next 20, 30 years. West Africa, Central Africa, East Africa is a completely different story because the urban transitions are off a very low base. And so we are gonna see a more than doubling of urban populations in a relatively short space of time. Now, what it is, I just wanna sort of very quickly draw your attention to in this particular infographic, is the, is the sort of regional corridor characteristic of the urban footprint in West Africa in particular. And this I would suggest considering, uh, you know, sort of a number of geopolitical factors, uh, drought, climate change, uh, uh, Islamic militancy, um, uh, all kinds of cross-border complexities and so forth, you know, sort of presents uh, a very obvious example of where we need to absolutely move past the sort of nation state frame of thinking about how one responds to these uh, regional questions. Um, the, the, the second point to make, of course, is that um, there are two key dynamics to understand in terms of the specificity of urbanization. The one is the nature of labor markets, which are uh, predominantly informal. And to read the question of labor markets, secondly, in relation to the demographic profile of the African continent, and that is that um, up to 60% uh, of the population is younger than 24 years of age, and just over 50% is younger than 19 years of age. And so what that means is that over the next 30 years, we are going to see a trebling of the labor, labor force uh, in the continent, and that labor force is going to be in, sort of increasingly urban-based and urbanized. Um, and so what this means is that the dominant form, of course, and I, no one on this call wouldn't know this, but just to sort of restate the point, that the dominant form of urbanism is, uh, is, is informal. And so the kinds of pressures we can expect and the argument that I want to make is that these pressures are increasingly political. They're not just sort of socioeconomic dynamics. They uh, also because the electorate um, has got a very different sensibility towards the political system. So the pressures are obvious, jobs, obviously, and if you have a, a sort of predominantly youthful population, that is significant. Um, housing, um, essential services, uh, um, connectivity, of course. Uh, we know that some of the fastest uptake rates of mobile internet is on the African continent, um, and despite uh, very low GDP per capita numbers. And then, of course, uh, affordable mobility. And I would argue the sort of final pressure is this demand for voice. And what we've just seen on the streets of Dakar or in the streets of Lagos in the last couple of months, you know, just these examples of what I would argue is a fairly common pattern now uh, across the continent where uh, there's no shyness to express political dissatisfaction and happiness on the streets uh, through direct action and various kinds of protests. Now, of course, what we've seen in the last year is the COVID overlay and what that really brought home is the fact that there is within these very specific urban uh, contexts, no room for, for maneuver. There's no room to move in the literal sense in terms of social distancing, in terms of all of the requirements that was suggested needed to be done to ensure that we could contain uh, the pandemic. And in fact, again, from a sort of political economy risk point of view, we've seen a, a reversal of some socioeconomic progress over the last 15 years with the sort of onset of the Millennium Development Goals. Um, and so there's sort of a, a heightening of the pressure in, in the system uh, across the continent. And of course, unsurprisingly, uh, as, as the Moe Brian index, recent index tells us, there's been an erosion of trust and confidence uh, in the state. 
Now, one of the things that I think is um, really important uh, to, to, to keep in mind in this context is, is a set of really uh, critical global dynamics. And that, of course, is we've seen the continued regionalization of the, the, the global system. Um, this is just an infographic that sort of demonstrates uh, the spatial anchorage of the global economy. But of course, what sits behind this is the fact that between China, the USA, the EU 27 and India, they alone account for 60% of global GDP. And in that context, as you can see Africa um, from sort of this kind of representation and sort of all of Geshe's caveats about representation and what we foreground is, 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 is uh, assumed um, is almost invisible in this particular reading of the global landscape. And it is for that reason that um, the coming into effect of the African continental free trade area uh, in, in the beginning of this year is so important and significant. Africa has the lowest rate of interregional intra -regional, uh, trade in the world. Um, and uh, until last year, it was still below 20%, whereas the norm for most of these other four regions that I've mentioned um, is anything uh, above 50% up until 65%. And so you can begin to see the relationship between the limiting effect of an effective uh, uh, regulatory framework around trade and exchange um, and positioning within the global system. Now, why all of this matters, if you remember that map that I just showed you and the sort of very particular kind of uh, spatial dynamic of the West African region, um, is that we obviously need to recognize that there's an enormous amount of, uh, and again, drawing on Geshe's words, anticipation and preparation to be conducted to really fully understand and explore what the national sub-national and local implications might be of a common free trade uh, area uh, in, in, in the case of Africa. And we haven't yet started that debate. So one of the things that I think is really critical at this intersection that Ian uh, pointed us to is precisely to begin, I think, to, to unpack that. But the proposition I want us to reflect on today is that, uh, is that the optimizing the common uh, African uh, trading area requires regional specialization, trade and mutuality, right? So if we think of the building blocks of the common trading area, it's the Southern Africa trading region, it's the West Africa region, East Africa and so forth. And these have been there for some time, but they have been underperforming in a spectac spectacular way. And so can we give a substantive anticipatory policy agenda to the subregions and begin to think of this very important rescaling of policy and political discussions away from the nation state as the only voice and actor, but towards these subregional entities and towards city regions within that. And I think that um, this is something that is worth, that can get momentum if we pay attention to the debate uh, from Agenda 2063, which is a sort of uh, predominant pan-African policy framework, that green industrialization is the pathway to address the structural constraints on African economies and also to reposition the common African trading area into a global economy that is beginning to introduce regulatory measures to ensure low carbon dematerialized uh, economic flows. And of course, we could argue that that has been accelerated by COVID because one of the takeaways from this pandemic is a fundamental rethink of global value chains and to reinforce the regional underpinning and imperatives of, uh, um, of, 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 of rethinking global value chains to not just deal with the risk associated with pandemics of this nature, but also to harvest the benefits of a smaller footprint if one is able to localize these value chains. Now, sort of very practically, um, what does the green economy and its sort of driving force of a green industrial strategy mean at the urban scale? Because I think if we can answer that question, we can begin to figure out what some of the substantive political and policy fodder might be uh, 
for these actors to grow into a more assertive role in the pan-African context. So one is we know we've got to build completely differently, right? So what that imagination is precisely, I'm not too sure. And again, Geshe's sort of visual representations of the sort of bifurcation of this debate uh, is a reminder of just how much work we still need to do. But what we do know is that we've got to look at indigenous materials, we've got to understand climatic conditions, and we obviously have to use uh, materials that, that, that enables one to dematerialize uh, the economy. Linked to that is renewable energy systems. And again, there's a fantastic and critical uh, sort of organizational logic to renewable energy but that allows for decentralized systems, uh, as we know. And similarly, integrated public transport systems, sanitation and waste systems that is consistent with circular economy principles and city regional based, water catchment based urban food systems, as it would be another domain. So these are all very large regional systems as in city regional systems that have to be imagined, that have to be substantiated in an enormous amount of detail. But the critical issue is that that substantiation has got to respond to specific uh, landscape, material, cultural, social, political context, but also be interoperable with other regions within this Pan-African framework. Now, my argument would be that the, the, the sort of the substance of that, the how of that, we don't know. And at the moment, our higher education institutions and so forth, and the research and development infrastructures we have on the continent, as anemic as they may be, are not in any way geared towards uh, addressing these questions. And so, for example, if we take those systems, you know, we know that some of the cross-cutting criteria for an alternative system that is sufficiently open-ended, if we sort of go back to Geshe's um, closing framework um, uh, around discovery, creation, or adaptation, if, if the, uh, so those would probably be the zones that one is talking about, the way to really resolve the question of novelty or of deep innovation is that whatever responses we come up with, we know that they've got to meet certain criteria. They've got to be labor intensive. They've got to be generative of enterprises and entrepreneurialism. They've got to be affordable, whatever the solutions are. They've got to be digitally enabled. They've got to be modular and interoperable with other components in the system. And what that means is they've got to fundamentally plug into an, an intensely and intensively hybrid system that we've got of formal and informal systems that cohabit and feed off each other. So sort of to really think through the detail of all of that, I would argue, cannot be done outside of a systematic innovation platform that is publicly funded, that is networked across the continent, and that is not just geared to answer some of these questions, but also thinking about what that means for institutional recalibration across scales so that one can begin to build a very, very different uh, uh, sort of regional city, regional based system within this uh, common trading area. And that can then become the sort of core and the, 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 the sort of functional driving point of what a green industrial strategy for Africa might look like. So to conclude then, um, to sort of come back to uh, this, this question of, um, of, of, of this work that I'm doing uh, for the Gauteng city region. And I was kind of on the basis of this talk, just thinking through what, what my recommendations might be um, for uh, the Gauteng city region observatory. And, you know, it strikes me that the first thing they have to do uh, as, 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 as an urban observatory is to not just provide evidence about the socioeconomic regional dynamics in the Harting City region, but they've got to really get much better at understanding the regional economic system and its linkages into, into the continent. And that means expanding the focus from the kind of quality of life survey work they've been doing to really understanding the basis for regional economies. And then to begin to think through that if there's a mapping of the Gauteng city region with that conurbation in West Africa, with that cluster in East Africa connected into Kigali, with the sort of <clears throat> Cairo Alexandra cluster and then the cluster around Casablanca and so forth, what would be the comparative and competitive dynamics between these city regions and how would one aggregate 
a continental-wide innovation system that can allow for deep specialization rooted in context, but also the extraction of, if you will, commonalities that can be imagined as a commons, a knowledge commons. And figuring out the institutional mechanisms for that knowledge commons, I think, gives city regions a very unique voice and place uh, uh, to sort of within a geopolitical context. And again, to just remind us, the argument here is that if Africa is trying to pursue an endogenous model of growth that is cognizant of climate constraints, that wants to address uh, uh, the material constraints issues, um, but also has to address large scale poverty and exclusion. It, it, it has decided to do that through a green industrialization strategy. The substance of that remains vague and it is definitely not spatialized. And my argument would be that particularly the critical city regions are extremely well placed to give that substance and to take the lead. And that is the provocation I wanted to leave you with today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edgar. Um, that was a, 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 a really powerful talk that I think spoke very strongly both to Geshe's points made earlier and also um, is a really good way to, to sink into the second session we have coming up. Um, we now are, are, are going to start the discussion session, which we have about 25 minutes for. And I'd first like to ask if uh, Geshe and Edgar would like to reflect on each other's talks in further detail or ask any particular questions of um, each other. Um, I'd be happy to kick off. Since Edgar is not feeling well, I think we must torture him while we can. Um, <laughs> Edgar, um, 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 I, I, think, I think what you share is really interesting in terms of this idea that city regions could lead uh, in this vision. And what I wondered is whether you might reflect a little bit on the kinds of perhaps new capabilities, and I mean that very broadly, that you think that kind of leadership might require, um, because that, that is the question that I'm sort of left with. Sure. Um, I mean, the obvious answer is I don't know. Um, but, you know, I, I'll, I'll, you know, sort of as us academics do, I will say something because, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we can't help ourselves, I guess. Um, so I think the one is um, <clears throat> to understand that um, the relative power of the state. Right, so, so I'm just still struck by how, particularly in the South African context, which is in a more immediate um, reality for me, how there is this completely deluded assumption on the part of politicians and senior public sector officials that actors in the private sector and civil society and global institutions are you know, unbelievably privileged to have airtime with them. You know, they just don't understand their relative uh, power in, in an interdependent system. So, I, so for me, one of the first capabilities is to really think very differently about relational power and, um, and to understand the importance of building coalitions, not in the narrow political sense across party lines, well, in the South African case, with across factional lines within your party, which is a very important skill. Um, but... Um, but I, so, so that's definitely one. The second is, you know, we also, I think, have done very poorly in figuring out how uh, public leaders can work um, in a really productive and generative way with knowledge institutions to give them data, evidence, trends, and so on, but also to help them with, I think, the point you made, Geshe, on to reframe the question, right? Because there's certain habits of seeing and certain um, sort of bureaucratic imperatives in terms of interests you've got to serve and, 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 and message, messages you've got to convey. And to kind of recognize that the world is larger, that this is a bigger set of issues you've got to be thinking about and helping leaders understand that. And, um, and I'm you know, sort of struck, and I'll give one small example, and this is not, uh, you know, uh, uh, and I, I have to do a bit of name dropping to do it, but it's just to illustrate the point. Um, so I had a meeting with um, the Minister of Science and Innovation five weeks ago or so, 
and I just read the white paper that came out in 2019 in preparation of that meeting and so on. And I asked him, you know, so they've got some really cool ideas in there, right? Because it's the usual story written by policy consultants and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, whether that the department actually has internalized anything in that white paper is a completely another story. But, you know, and I said, you know, what is given a, the arguments I just made now, given Agenda 2063, given where we're trying to go, your argument for community-based innovation is really powerful, you know, and what is your vision and imagination for extending that into the continent as a conversation with your peers, with other ministers of science and technology of science and innovation, so that we can really build something that speaks to this idea of endogenous, uh, indigenous uh, knowledge in the Agenda 2063. But, you know, the animating idea in Agenda 2063 is that you bring together indigenous knowledge systems and the knowledge economy. Right, that's the core epistemic notion in Agenda 20, which is amazing. Like, I mean, as a, a door that is kind of ajar to, to walk through, to really sort of be as ambitious as you were suggesting in your talk, Keshi. And, you know, but he just didn't see that connection at all. And you could just see in that discussion, even though it was on Zoom, um, you know, the sort of, uh, to, to the, you know, the, like the, you could just see the scales falling off his eyes. He was really seeing, oh, wow. You know, and he could see politically uh, how that could be useful, but he could also see how that could really take them out of a very, very specific and very narrow South African specific debate about these things, right? Which is attached to HSRC, attached to the science councils here and so on and so on. So that's one example. So I think that, you know, really thinking through how we help them, for, you know, one of the capabilities is to recognize that that by virtue, by virtue of your position and the history of your department and its policy processes, you can only see certain issues. And, but there's absolutely things beyond that. And how do you surface that? And the third one uh, is actually, uh, I mean, is, is very, 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 very much this idea that you need to run three or four operating systems at the same time. So I think a lot of uh, politicians struggle to recognize that, you know, they think that they give instructions and the system has got to be responsive. And that's not how public institutions work. You know? So you've got to recognize that. And, and it's sort of, I guess, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, Geshi. So if we go with your um, sort of frame and, uh, which, and, uh, and thank you for your talk. I, it, it was unbelievably helpful uh, to sort of with, with some stuff I'm struggling with at the moment. But, um, but, you know, I was thinking through your, your discovery creative uh, end of, of uh, uh, that, that, that quadrant and, and the question of the scale and depth of basic needs, right? So if we take sanitation, for example, so we know we can't solve, you know, we can't, it's not acceptable that such large proportions of our populations just have to do without any form of uh, let's call it, for lack of a better word, modern sanitation systems. Doesn't have to be waterborne, but just let's just say uh, safe and affordable sanitation. Um, and so there are certain things that we kind of, so I guess this is what I was struggling with in terms of your frame. So certain things we know, we kind of know what needs to be done and they must just bloody well get on and do it and be held accountable to do it. But we also know that within that space, you know, there are new systems emerging that can allow for community control, that can take the circular economy principles, and you can think of using the waste streams into local agricultural systems. Uh, you can track public health outcomes through, you know, sort of simple sensors introduced into, into that, that localized uh, sanitation system and so on. So you kind of don't want them to go and obsess about a smart sanitation system and the circular economy. You kind of want them to solve sanitation because that's urgent, but you need another level of innovative capacity that can test and experiment with that. That's what I mean with multiple operating systems. And so for me, you know, the capability that's needed is to recognize you know, whether it's mobility, whether it's um, whatever, that principle applies in a context of large scale poverty, deep inequality, and a state that is just not fulfilling its mandates in terms of delivering on basic socioeconomic rights. Um, yeah, let me stop there, thanks. Um, Andy, do we still have time? Can I 
have the chat. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, no, I think that's a great uh, a question. And, and for me, what's useful there, Edgar, I think is this issue of empowerment and agency, right? So, I mean, we use these ideas or we refer to these ideas of co-production and empowerment and choice. I mean, choice is a good one. I mean, um, I, for example, know that I could have quite an amazing set of technologies in my home uh, that are much more sustainable in the long term. I don't have all of them, but I'm not doing without water and electricity in the meantime, I'm doing what I can. Uh, and I think our inability to trust that communities or that same logic holds, uh, uh, even for the masses, perhaps is partly the challenge here. Um, uh, and that's why, I, and I like what you were doing already is playing with those quadrants. They're not mutually exclusive. There are existing problems we know. There are new solutions, but there's nothing in you know, there's nothing that prevents you from doing one while you uh, develop the capacity to do the other. So, uh, so I think for me, it's really that space uh, and, 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 and in a way allowing people to evolve capacities over time in the same way that we all do individually. But for some reason, I think we have different standards and different approaches uh, at different levels. So maybe that would be my comment on that one. I'd like to use the opportunity though to just pull you up also in scale because uh, I guess we are partly here in this conversation also talking about um, the bigger sort of geopolitics around these issues. And the other thing that struck me as you were talking about this green industrial strategy for Africa and I think some of the powerful ideas for how we can endogenize that is that I was, uh, uh, I, I participated or I sat in on a talk last week uh, by the Southern Center for Inequality Studies. Uh, and they had, you know, the Reserve Bank and Treasury and all these people talking about what these conversations have been globally. And what really struck me is that a, a big, in, in, in fact, almost the only thing that was uh, really emphasized in the initial part of the talk was how we needed to be very aware and responsive to the decarbonization agenda and legislative moves by the EU and China. So this was actually not a <laughs> sort of, you know, this is the elephants fighting and, and all we are is, is sort of down here trying to figure out how to survive uh, uh, this. Uh, and then people kept coming back to the idea that we needed to probably also have a position on these issues. But uh, one was really struck by how this was really painted as a, 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 a game for the big boys. Uh, and I don't know how you think, uh, you know, what's our, again, geopolitically, what's our capacity, the capacity of our national leadership, our regional leadership, our local leadership to sort of respond mm -hmm. or have a position in that mm -hmm. sort of game? Yeah, no, absolutely. And again, again, you know, the I was just looking through uh, Yaki Salia's new book, uh, you know, to prepare for today. And so he um, gives us a uh, you know, he says, so, so he works with the international futures model, right, to locate uh, the African continent. Um, and so obviously one has to take some of it with some circumspection, but, you know, that's a nice ballpark, you know, sort of to work with. And, you know, and, and so according to him, um, uh, we, Africa's uh, regional economy, you know, we are now uh, around 18% of the global population and we still 2.5% of global GDP. And, you know, project forward 2040, uh, you know, we'll be closer to 27% of the global population, which is really dramatic. And best case scenario, 4% of global GDP. So, you know, so if so, so this thing about, you know, what happens between the EU and China, it obviously, it is absolutely fundamental, you know, so we can't not pay attention to those sort of uh, ructions in the multilateral system. Um, but that's exactly the opportunity, I think, is to kind of, we can read those signals pretty easily because you, you know, it's not rocket science exactly, but how do we reframe that as a Pan-African agenda, drawing on the ideological reference points of Agenda 2063, because like the SDGs, it's, you know, it's both, challenging but it's also consoling to some extent you know we can feel nice warm and fuzzy and we can build a shared narrative but the devil is in the detail about how you translate and then for me that is the political art right and that is to say that you know for Cape Town for Johannesburg for uh, Lagos whatever you know sort of our contribution to the African narrative is x y and z and so for, of course for certain places like a Lagos or an Accra you know, where there are hard choices about fossil fuel uh, mixes that is gonna have to be made uh, at a national and regional level in, in the next 10 years. You know, the implications can't be more radical, but that's the point. 
So for them to accelerate their renewables agenda, and in a way not in response to what happens at the global regulatory level because of the fallout of the EU-China debate, but to kind of be completely proactive, I think is the challenge, right? But how do we embed that in a discourse in a language that's ours, that's not reactive? And that I think is what we haven't quite yet cracked. And I think, you know, sort of savvy city leaders, uh, governors, premiers, and so on, um, because these big NEPAD infrastructure investments are going to land in these spaces, you know, so they've got to build a vocabulary and a discourse that they can speak into these things and begin to apply pressure. And, uh, and I think, for example, you know, just let's just play this out, you know, you can see a premier of Gauteng with the commission of, of, of SADC, you know, sort of being having a seat at the AU to persuade the South African government to accelerate its targets. Right. Why is that not an imagination we can, we can have, right? So, so it's, that's the kind of, I think, uh, both uh, sort of how the global geopolitical dynamics can feed on, but it, for me, that is really just a, a spur to, to reimagine, rethink um, the kind of uh, policy advocacy that city leaders and regional leaders can play. Thanks. Thank you. I guess, you, would you like to uh, respond back to that? Or shall we go straight? No. No, no, I, I don't. I completely agree. And I think those kind of um, constellations, you know, different constellations of, uh, of, of advocacy and activism uh, in leadership, I think would be amazing to see. So no, I have nothing to add. It's great. Thanks, Geshi. Um, so just as a reminder to everyone, um, you can put your questions in the chat um, or you can use the raise hand function um to uh ask a question uh verbally we do have one question uh from eva garcia um Chueca, and it's a question for geshi uh you referred to the imposition of certain urban agenda solutions or answers from international organization stakeholders um which are the agendas you think are mostly being imposed on the african continent you you already mentioned the smart So, so, so it's a tricky one because I suppose by using the term imposition, which, which I used and which I guess does risk sounding very negative, it might sound like I think that the issue is a problem uh, and, and, and I don't in all cases. So I'm, I'm just using that as sort of the disclaimer on what I'm about to say, which is, you know, there's a lot that does get brought from the outside. I, I think that the fact that the climate agenda, and now this sounds terrible because now it sounds like I'm saying the climate agenda is not important. But I think the fact that it gets centered in the way that it does, uh, uh, I, I think is an example of something that perhaps is, is less emergent from the specific climate issues people may face here and maybe more reflective of what people are told is, 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 is what's important. Uh, I think I, I gave the example of the BRT, so some of the transport solutions, I think, was maybe the most evident uh, example, I think, of, of something that went wrong. Uh, I, I'm right now doing a lot in the digital innovation space, and there's a lot there that's being driven by people saying what's important. And, and again, like I said, just the caution that when I say impose and that it's external doesn't mean the issues aren't important. It's, it's I guess, the way they come in and where they locate themselves within existing local agendas. Um, uh, in a way, maybe the, the closest, um, 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 you know, I, I would liken it almost to the way NGOs behave. So any of you who've been in the NGO world know that there's this need to respond to what the funder or whatever the powerful party is usually the funder uh, uh, indicates as the current agenda. And I think in many ways we see countries and cities in Africa behaving very similarly that uh, whatever the new headline is, is, is where all troops move. Uh, and there's a real danger in that, I think, in ignoring that some, many of the fundamental problems are still there and the capacity to maybe push back or to reprioritize or to locate these things within a locally relevant discourse and agenda. I, I think that's what becomes problematic. So there are many, there are many, many examples. Thanks, Geshi. That's great. Um, we now have a question uh, for Edgar from Hannah Abdullah. Um, could you elaborate on how indigenous knowledge and practices could or already are informing green industrialization strategies at the city regional scale in Africa? How could global ecological agendas like the EU Green Deal benefit from a more dynamic relationship between local knowledges and macroeconomic strategies? Over to Edgar. 
Thanks, Hannah, and lovely to hear from you. Um, so, um, yeah, and I miss Barcelona, so um, damn, COVID. And it's based in Barcelona. Um, so, so I think that um, there's two parts to this in terms of the, the first half of, of your, or the, your first question. Um, so I would differentiate between two kinds of uh, indigenous knowledge. So the one is, uh, you know, the more conventional understanding that there are certain practices um, in relation to uh, natural systems, uh, particularly uh, the land that um, have endured, have adapted itself, but have endured in some form or the other. And these are deployed in different ways by, um, by, by particularly poor and vulnerable communities in both rural and urban settings. And then there is um, the necessary hacking that happens of the mainstream infrastructure or service delivery systems or the economic systems for people to be able to access opportunities and to conduct and exercise their livelihood strategies. Um, so hacking uh, electricity grid or hacking into the water system or, you know, so this is all what, so we label these things as informal uh, um, uh, sort of strategies. And I guess it's been theorized more broadly as, as, as forms of encroachment. Um, um, uh, of, of daily life uh, in these cities and that they are constitutive, right? They're not something outside of the formal system, but they're constitutive. So I think really understanding the fine grain of those things um, through ethnographic research, through uh, sort of forms of co-production and so on is absolutely essential to be able to combine that understanding with an emergent global discourse about innovation in relation to uh, uh, sustainable approaches to infrastructure provision or design or whatever. And interestingly, when you bring those together, there's a certain design translation that is required. And I mean design in the broader sense here, both in terms of uh, processes that are uh, culturally embedded. In other words, it speaks to uh, cultural specificities. It, it speaks to um, uh, demand structures, it speaks to local sensibilities of beauty, of aesthetics, and so on. Um, but very importantly, it's functional and it's affordable, right? So, the, and, and uh, design in the second sense, which is spatial, so that it understands landscape, it understands context, and it is able to embed itself. So, that's what I, why I think you need these city based innovation or experimentation, whatever you want to call it, but these institutional formats which isn't necessarily one organization, but it could be a space where different knowledge institutions come together and work on very specific issues in specific territories or geographies. Um, so, so for me, that's one. And to give you one example about how this could sort of feed into an industrial strategy, um, there's been a lab that has worked in the South African context on how to take alien vegetation, um, and repurpose that. So it has to be culled because these things are 100 times more thirsty than indigenous vegetation in a water scarce region. So we have to, to, to remove them um, uh, to restore ecosystems, but also to deal with the water crisis. But these can then be repurposed as a construction material uh, that is low carbon. So they wood chip them and they put them in a, in a cement mix and it only uses 10% of the cement equivalent of a conventional construction technology. And they've designed a construction method that is non-mechanical. So it is 100% labor intensive. And so here you've got a, 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 a technological innovation that restores ecological systems, that provides employment, that responds to a widespread need, which is housing, um, and can be scaled it can, at an industrial scale. And you can very easily adapt the techn technology into open source uh, 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 um, uh, uh, templates that can then be adapted in other places. So that would be sort of one example that I can, uh, when, if, when we have time, I can explain to you why that is not happening and what all of the institutional and bureaucratic and political dynamics are that is preventing from that innovation to come uh, to the fore, but that is a very practical example that I've been tracking in the case of South Africa. Um, 
and how could global ecological agendas, blah, 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 benefit from. Um, so what I know the EU has invested in very heavily is precisely what I've just said. So I've been stunned to see the back end of the innovation system that is being invested in and the scale of that investment and how that is radically decentralized and localized in the EU context as ways of creating the investable projects that, will, that the new funding streams uh, can go into. And what has struck me about these new institution, intermediary institutions that have been created in the EU context is precisely how it really, really promotes localization, right? So you've got the super strong European level discourse and narrative and sense of positioning of the EU identity within the global transition sort of landscape, but it then creates institutions that enable radical localization. And so I think the EU is kind of, I, I mean, it's too early to tell if it's gonna work, but I think they're getting it, they're putting their money in the right kind of institutional formats to do that kind of translation work uh, that I would suggest. We don't have any of those frameworks or any of those institutional architectures or funding sources. So what I'm talking about is one of, you know, sort of Geshe's uh, um, uh, discovery domain things um, you know, but we, we have no, um, I'm, I'm sure there's people on this call, you know, who has the money to, to, to bring it to life, maybe, hopefully, we, you know, cross fingers, but yeah, but you know, but it's completely in the realm of, 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 of imaginary speculation for us, but it is a, a very real institutional material reality in the EU context, as far as I understand. Um, okay. Oh, sorry, I'm just reading Michele's question. Do you want to read it, uh, Andy? Yes, we have time for one more quick question. Okay. This is from um, Michele Akutu at the Connected City Labs in Melbourne, who will be hosting the next Great Powers and Urbanization event in a few weeks. His question um, and, and, and comment is, he fully agrees on the potential for, city, for a city regional angle, and that resonates a lot here too, down under in Australia. But I'm also wondering if, if I could ask um, Edgar to expand a bit more on whether they can also result in a more straight jacketing of local innovation and dependence on dominant global discourses on innovation that might limit local city capacity. Um, yeah, I think that risk is always there, uh, uh, Michele. Um, uh, but I, I think for me, it is about how you design those local platforms, right? So if you have the right sort of uh, interdisciplinary mixes, and an understanding of the importance of being able to expertly facilitate participation by citizens and community organizations and so forth and do that kind of curation. I think you, so in other words, you can do institutional design of these local innovation systems that can prevent that, that or that can mitigate that risk. You know, you obviously you can't kind of completely prevent it, but I think you can mitigate it and if, if you have that mix. Um, the, the second issue is that um, I think, you know, that there's always translation that happens, right? So whatever, even if it's luck, you know, and, and going back to the first question we had, you know, even very, very sort of uh, aggressive discourses like resilience, right? Uh, even though they come with very strong and well-defined straight jacket policy frameworks and now anyone who's willing to go there, can remember the, the Rockefeller Foundation <clears throat> thing that Arab developed for them, you know, like, my God, you know, like you, uh, if I was a city manager or uh, whatever, you know, you'd, you'd absolutely feel like you're in a policy mental asylum if you want to implement that particular framework. Um, but, you know, that's what they all do because, and I also just wanted to say in relation to that first question, right? So let's remember what that system is, right? So you've got an idea, You've got lots of money behind it. You've got Northern consultancy firms and, and private sector firms that get hired to translate those agendas into policy frameworks. Those same bodies then do the transmutation into these geographies with local partners that are of the same ilk. And then it lands you know, politically within institutional contexts that are expected to be wowed by this, you know, we are in step with global fashion and so on and so on. So there's a whole, you know, sort of aesthetic and power play to that whole system, um, uh, which is extremely damaging and speaks to, you know, Michele, where your question is coming from, I think. 
Um, so, so how do we limit it? I think these local things have to be public bodies. They've got to be public interest bodies. They've got to be publicly funded in part. And therefore, they've got to be completely open source. They've got to be totally transparent. I think that that's the only way that one can ensure um, that the risks you're pointing to uh, won't, won't, be, um, uh, won't come to fruition. Thanks. Thank you, um, both Geshe and Edgar and everyone for those really helpful um, uh, interventions, comments and reflections. Um, this session really, I think, has highlighted um, the possibilities uh, and areas that still need to be addressed um, to enable and to focus on and to energize and to engage with um, dynamic and cross-scalar connections from the city to the city region, um, to the um, state region, to the international. And these possibilities and opportunities, I think, are really um, kind of important to keep in mind as we move on to the next ses session, which um, is where we focus more in on the particularities um, of particular sectors and particular case studies, um, and both the challenges and the opportunities that exist in relation to concerns such as health, um, uh, climate, um, and fiscal structures. So I'll now hand over to Gareth Hayson from the African Center for Cities, um, who will be moderating the second session. Over to Gareth. Thank you, Andy, and thank you to the presenters from the first session that was fascinating. And, and even the questions asked from everyone in, in the virtual room, thank you. Um, I can see sort of shadows of all my work and some of the challenges we face kind of being reflected in all of that. Um, Andy, you have kind of introduced the session already. So, but I, I think for me, this kind of how do we pay attention to the issues such as distrust, power imbalances um, across different scales, the differential power and the reach of these various international organizations that kind of emerge from the questions, but also the kind of realities of the enormity of the urbanization challenges across Africa and how this intersects with these top down interventions that might come across and how does this get translated into these bespoke questions that Edgar articulated, but how do we look at those through these different sectors? And so to do that, uh, we're lucky to introduce some of my colleagues from the ACC, uh, Warren Smith, Andy, I'm calling you to interject as well, Anton Cartwright and Liza Turalia. And this really, their, their bios will be added into the text and sort of warrant to speak to some of the work that he's done on urban health, Andy, uh, on, on kind of in your work on sexualities and health. Anton as an economist who's been with the ACC just a little bit less, not quite as long as Warren, who started in 2008, but since 2010, and look at the interaction between urbanization, environmental degradation, and, and human development, and speak specifically to the work done on sort of the national urban policies in, in Ghana and Tanzania that I'm sure will lift out a number of these issues discussed already. And Liza's work on, uh, focusing largely on the social, political and technical in, and institutional dimensions uh, of urban infrastructure, decentralization and human settlements in African cities. So you know, seeing the work reflected in the questions and the presentations before. So I'm gonna sort of go straight into this and kind of follow the program that, that, that was advertised with Warren going first. And then Andy, if you want to just lead off from, from, from Warren and then into Anton and close with Liza. Um, and then again, following the program from the sort of model before, let presenters each ask questions of one another and then we'll open it up to questions. And again, please feel free to pose questions in the chat or maybe try and get the opportunity to raise hands. I'm well aware of time and, and others might be sitting in Australia very late at night or very early in the morning elsewhere. So you might prefer to just type something into chat. If you can ask, please feel free to, to then ask in the room. So I'm gonna hand over to Warren straight away and ask you, Warren, please start. And I will sort of, yeah, with the 10 minutes each from these shorter inter interjections, thank you. Okay, thank you, Gareth. Um, so, so I hope you can all hear me. Um, so basically, I'm talking about uh, a particular example of a, a global program that was attempted to be applied in, in different places um, and how it kind of landed 
in different ways in in these different places. Um, so I'm specifically talking about the the World Health Organization and its Healthy Cities program, how the Healthy Cities program landed in in African cities, using Cape Town as an example. So. So basically, first I'll discuss WHO and the evolution of its Healthy Cities program. Quickly look at the example of Cape Town. Um, it was a very brief example, like in the late 90s, early 2000s, but I kind of highlight some of the challenges of applying these global programs in very different places, and then reflect on some of the challenges of implementing global programs like that. Uh, so first to start off with, with the World Health Organization, or WHO. Uh, so basically it was set up after the Second World War and the United Nations was established. So a number of global agencies were set up at that time, including WHO, which was essentially created as an intergovernmental agency to exercise international functions with the goal of improving global health. Um, so initially it had a very narrow focus on healthcare. Um, but from the late 90s, 1970s onwards, it kind of began to broaden its focus, to focus on health promotion rather than just the traditional focus on, on treating disease. And this was part of a broader kind of shift from the 1970s onwards about reinventing public health. Um, so to move away from just looking at health as the absence of disease, but kind of having a broader conception of what health was, looking at the physical and mental and spiritual kind of elements of, of global health as well. Um, and essentially between 1973 and 1988 was basically the golden age, the golden age of the WHO, because it had a very charismatic and inspiring leader, Dr. Hofdan Mahler. Um, and the WHO became very proactive and became widely respected as this lead organization in global health. And a particularly important um, initiative in the evolution of the Healthy Cities approach was WHO's Health for All by the Year 2000 strategy, which was developed in 1981. And that basically was about about recognizing the fact that governments are responsible for the health of the citizens and need to be active in promoting good health. And there needed to be a shift from only curing disease, which had been the kind of the de facto focus until that time, towards trying to prevent disease. Um, and this shift was also linked to the determinants of health approach, which, is, which is essentially derived from the application of the social ecological perspective to public health which was basically about recognizing the fact that living conditions had a much larger impact on health and well-being than the healthcare system. Uh, so through taking a socio-ecological approach to health, it's basically about recognizing that health and well-being are influenced by the physical environment, for example, geography and architecture and technology and the social environment, such as culture and economics and politics. So in particular, there was this recognition that urban environments had an enormous impact on health and on the well-being of residents. And, and it's a whole lot of interventions that you can make in the urban environment that have an enormous impact on health and well-being. Just simple things, often like putting in pavements or designing pedestrian-friendly streets, provision of housing, infrastructure like water and sanitation, how you design and, and locate recreation facilities, things like transport and urban agriculture and food markets, kind of how they're designed, where they are. <clears throat> Even the spatial form of cities, such as density and land use mix and street connectivity, can have an enormous impact on the health and well being of residents. Um, another important kind of milestone was the Ottawa Charter of 1986. So, in addition to recognizing the importance of the urban environment and health, it also recognized the importance of community participation. So the participation of individuals and groups and communities to try and increase their control over the determinants of health and thereby help improve their health. And all of these shifts from a focus on individual, on the individual to the, the broader context and the shift from um, a very narrow focus on health to a much broader focus and on preventing disease resulted essentially in the Healthy Cities Initiative in the late 1980s. 
So that essentially became like a global program that the WHO then kind of developed and implemented in different regions. And it started basically in 1987 with the WHO European office initiated its Healthy Cities program, which was about basically to support integrated approaches to health promotion at the, at the local level. Um, <clears throat> and it's basically highlighted the relationship between urban environment health and the role of local government in promoting health at the city scale. So they defined a healthy city as one that's, a, that's continually creating and improving those physical and, and social environments and expanding those community resources which enable people to mutually support each other in performing all the functions of life and developing to the maximum potential. So very much linked to like a quite a broad understanding of health and well-being and and to it's essentially about broader human development. Um, in practice, the program focused on public health experts driving participatory processes to make cities healthier using a range of tools such as regulations, planning, <clears throat> and the implementation of, of specific projects and programs um, in specific places and specific issues. <clears throat> so the introduction of the Healthy Cities program was accompanied by a whole series of events to spread the idea. For example, in 1988, the first um, International Healthy Cities Conference was held in, in, in Liverpool. Um, and then the Healthy Cities concept rapidly spread around the world and was enthusi enthusiastically adopted by governments and civil society. And the initial 11 WHO Healthy Cities kind of grew by the mid-1990s to a few hundred different cities, um, mainly in the global north, but then it also started to kind of be taken up in the global south, which became a challenge because many of the ideas around the Healthy Cities program had been developed in the global north, kind of basically assumed that you would have effective and accountable local government that had lots of capacity you could, and could intervene in the urban environment through regulations such as land use zoning schemes and subsidy incentives and so on. A lot of that didn't really apply in the global south, where local government was often much weaker, undercapacitated, large proportion of residents often living in informal areas where there wasn't a lot of ability to intervene through regulation and, and many of the tools that local governments in the global north would use. Um, yeah, so that so in the late 1990s, WHO held various capacity developing exercises in Africa to, to develop a number of healthy city projects in Africa. And one of those was one in Cape Town that was implemented in 1997. And, and at the time, Cape Town was ripe for experimentation because that, you know, that we were in the midst of the transition to democracy. There had been a whole lot of local government restructuring, a new, um kind of metropolitan council had just been established uh, and there was recognition that were very enormous health problems in cape town with high levels of urban inequality and a very large burden of disease so the cape metropolitan council basically initiated its healthy studies project um which was actually in 1996 set up some participatory forums at the city scale with an overall steering committee from different departments with politicians and officials, and then and, and identified a number of local areas where they set up participatory forums to implement kind of quite a broad range of projects to try and improve health conditions in certain areas like Kailicha and Ocean View within Cape Town, driven by these multi-stakeholder forums. Um, it was a challenge. The public health officials didn't really have much experience of community participation, um, kind of struggled to to manage these participation processes. But there were a number of important successes. But then the project was terminated in the early 2000s. So in about 2002, the project basically ground to a halt for a number of reasons, such as at the time, South Africa went through another wave of local government restructuring, um, and the Cape Metropolitan Council was kind of disbanded. A whole new set of legislation around doing integrated development planning was introduced which basically in some way kind of superseded 
previous attempts at integrated planning, like the Healthy Cities program. Um, and also, it didn't really have much political support. Uh, things like housing and infrastructure had kind of much more political kind of you know, recognition and, and championing. Um, and also the fact it was, as Geshe was mentioning with many of these global programs, it was seen as something kind of external, where, whereas the integrated development planning process was kind of a homegrown initiative that was developed quite collaboratively during the 1990s. Um, so as the Healthy Cities project in Cape Town drew to a close, uh, there was a potential for many of the objectives of this project to be kind of transplanted to the new Cape Town Integrated Development Plan. And initially it did look promising because the first integrated development plan that the new unified city of Cape Town drew up in 2001 did actually, as one of its nine key pledges, did have a healthy city for all the people as one of its pledges. But that kind of very quickly withered away. So the previous, uh, the subsequent integrated development plans actually had very little mention of health, only mention of health in the next one was around HIV AIDS and TB. So like a very broad understanding of the needs to move to a healthy city kind of very quickly fell off the agenda and kind of was reduced to solely a focus on, on healthcare. Um, and very similar things happened in other parts of Africa. So as a result, although WHO still has a healthy cities program, um, with healthy city initiatives in most regions of the world. In Africa, they do not currently have any healthy cities initiatives. I know there was one attempt in Accra recently, but other than that, the healthy cities program in Africa has basically been replaced by focusing on healthy villages, healthy homes, healthy schools, and healthy food markets. Um, yeah, and not at the city scale anymore. Um, and part of the reason for these very modest achievements of the Health and Studies program and why it challenged in Africa was that, on one hand, it was very ambitious, didn't, didn't kind of sufficiently recognize the complexity of governance and politics and particip participation processes, um, which was also, also based on the quite outmoded idea of the modernist belief in the power of science and expertise to be able to solve complex problems and on the belief that technical rational solutions can solve complex socio-political problems, which is not often not the case, usually not the case. Um, so essentially it was turned from this very, initially a very value-driven movement to a very techno-managerial process. Um, and one scholar has also argued that the whole notion of community participation in the Health Studies program was based on this very idealized and romanticized notion of democracy and how participation resulted in consensus, which is very seldom what happens in, in practice, didn't sufficiently recognize how power and knowledge operate. And then also the whole program was essentially contradictory in its concept, because on the one hand, it was about popular participation, but on the hand, other hand, it was a top-down international program. Um, so yeah, there was an inherent kind of tension in that, in that it was encouraging local participation and local innovation while being this global top-down techno-managerial program. So there still is a WHO Health and Studies program, but it's much less prominent than it was. There's essentially been a shift from implementing participatory health-driven initiatives to trying to get policymakers and urban planners to think about health and incorporate health more explicitly into what they do. For example, the Urban Heart Tool, which is like a tool for policymakers to think about intra-urban health inequalities and how to lessen them. And then since 2016, of course, the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs have kind of superseded and subsumed many previous programs like a lot of the Healthy Cities work. And the 2016 Shanghai Declaration was essentially a recognition of that. It was trying to promote health within the sustainable development agenda, because essentially the sustainable development agenda has become the dominant kind of global agenda. Um, so basically, this is just a story of, and I hope I haven't gone over time, it's just a story of how a global agency with very good intentions really struggled to implement a global program to make cities healthier. And the reality is that if you look in Africa over the past few decades, um, the opposite has been the case. There's been a growing burden of disease, increases in intra-urban health disparities, 
increases in urban food insecurity, continued challenges with infectious diseases like Ebola and COVID. Um, so essentially the need to make cities healthier is more important than ever. And we do need global agencies and global programs to support that. But they, they shouldn't be top-down technical managerial programs. They need to be much more flexible, allow for different processes to emerge in different places. For example, through the use of co-production methodologies that bring together different policymakers and civil society and other stakeholders to redefine local problems and trying to come up with context-specific solutions. And the role of civil society in that is really essential. For example, the people's health movement is like a global alliance of, of local community health groups. And, and the role of civil society is really essential in ensuring the accountability of, of government and the implementation of these types of programs. Uh, thanks, Gareth. Uh, no, sorry, did I go over time? No, no it's, I think it's fascinating to get the history and provide the great background to that. So thanks so much, Warren. I think it segues into Andy and, and, and his discussion. So Andy, if you want to pick up from that, we can, I'm sure you'll, I've got a set of questions already for you, Warren, but I'm sure others will have those as well. Thanks, Gareth. And um, thanks, Warren. Um, so I think just the first reflection to make is that what I want to talk about and what Warren has just spoken about uh, in a recent historical context have some distinct similarities. And one way to connect um, our two talks would be to argue that those that don't know history are doomed to repeat it. And also that those that don't know the history of different sectors are doomed to repeat the same problems. So what I want to talk about today are the challenges that exist in the ways that the US President's Emergency Plan for Age Relief, or PEPFAR, operates to support the needs of marginalized groups such as men who have sex with men and trans across African cities. I also want, at the end of my uh, intervention here, to gesture towards the kind of work that still needs to be done to connect transversally and also hierarchically divergent needs and divergent agendas which pivot around the role of the African city in global public health. So to begin, and just as some background, PEPFAR was created in 2003 by the then US President George W. Bush and has to date spent more than 90 billion US dollars in attempts to eradicate HIV AIDS in the global south and especially across Africa. Prior to COVID, it was the largest global health initiative for a single infectious disease ever attempted. And by PEPFAR's own estimates, the program has saved more than 20 million lives to date. Now, of particular and significant importance to PEPFAR are certain key populations um, in Africa, of which the epidemiological categories, men who have sex with men and trans are two, due to these groups high HIV burden. This focus also has a key urban dimension due to the high HIV prevalence within African cities, especially for key populations. As an example of the sheer scale of endeavors to address HIV among these groups, in its 2019 annual report to the US Congress, PEPFAR indicated it had allocated 360 million US dollars to key populations, including men who have sex with men and trans. In South Africa alone, the US's most recent multi-year funding call for applications to support just men who have sex with men health programs in two cities in the country has a budget of 15 and a half million US dollars. Yet such significant resources into African countries by the US government have also come with significant challenges. And to begin to understand these, it's important to first appreciate the central place of NGOs. NGOs who successfully bid for funds from PEPFAR are tasked with being able to effectively interface and negotiate with city and regional government health authorities to be able to implement health services. For key populations, these services can include the creation of new key population targeted healthcare clinics, the widespread training of primary healthcare workers, and targeted key population community engagement activities designed to reduce HIV risks and encourage HIV testing, and if necessary, HIV treatment and care. Challenges, however, emerge when one considers the role of the NGO 
in relation to the ways in which, as various scholars have previously described, PEPFAR operates today within a neoliberal cost-benefit framing of healthcare provision. Here, PEPFAR today frames its activities very much in terms of a return on investment, where success is dependent on the effective collection of large amounts of quantitative data by NGOs and other country partners, which is then evaluated against dollars spent to, to decide if funding is to continue. Now, while such a framing in part makes sense, after all, it is US taxpayers who are providing very significant amounts of funds to enable PEPFAR to function, it also places significant emphasis on NGOs being able to collect data to then legitimate their existence. Every year, for example, the United States Global AIDS Coordinator and Ambassador at Large sends a planning level letter to US ambassadors, deputy ambassadors, or charged affairs, where PEPFAR has a presence outlining where funding should be increased and where funding should be cut due to low yields on investment. Now, this creates a series of, of, a series of potential knock-on issues, and there are three that I want to talk about here. First, these decisions regarding funding and funding cuts are clearly not being made necessarily in collaboration with in-country partners or with city or provincial authorities. Instead, it appears that Washington can directly and significantly influence where and how funding will continue or will be cut. This can then directly affect the healthcare budgets and services of cities or regional governments. After all, should US funding be cut, funding for services will either need to be taken over by cities or regional governments, taken over by other partners, or simply cease to exist. Such a situation developed, for example, in Cape Town in 2018, a city commonly framed as the gay mecca of Africa, and where there exists large-scale LGBT migration and large numbers of LGBT asylum seekers from the rest of the continent, when a central key population PEPFAR partner since 2010 ceased receiving PEPFAR funding via USAID. This meant that the scale of particular activities to support MSM and trans HIV healthcare in the city dramatically shifted in 2018. And for a while until other funding could be secured, the city of Cape Town and the province were being asked to find very significant funds to keep some type of programming running. So that's the first issue. And second, and connected to the first issue, to potentially limit such dramatic cuts in services, NGOs are implicitly encouraged only to undertake activities which can be directly reported back to PEPFAR's global monitoring system to then allow for cross-country comparisons. Now, while I don't have time to go into the particular, the, the particular technicalities of this somewhat Byzantine system, what this means is that certain activities, such as the provision of condoms and lubricant, can end up being provided only when aligned with the reporting timelines of PEPFAR, rather than the needs of same-sex communities themselves. In this instance, PEPFAR only wants individual level deduplicated data on provision of condoms and lubricants reported annually, while the actual need for such commodities among key population individuals may indeed be more frequent than once a year. Should an NGO go ahead and provide such commodities at a greater frequency to the same individuals, they run the risk of possibly appearing less cost effective to PEPFAR. The third issue, and perhaps most importantly, as recent work by a colleague of mine, Neil R. Hassan, and I have explored, is that there can also exist a significant disjuncture between what services NGOs offer to same-sex communities tied to quantitative data metrics and the actual needs of communities themselves. Ethnographic work we've been conducting in the former townships of Cape Town highlights how groups such as men who have sex with men are increasingly wary of NGOs who are allegedly tasked to assist them. Instead, there's an increasing sense that the wider needs of these communities, such as the development of social solidarity networks, economic empowerment, and the addressing of stigma and discrimination, which themselves can also be seen as crucial to develop resilient same-sex communities 
who are then able to undertake HIV service provision become sidelined. As a result, we're finding a situation in the townships of Cape Town where actual supposed recipients of support are increasingly engaging ambivalently and very strategically with NGOs who remain focused only on narrowly defined metrics of success. What this ultimately means for potentially limiting the effectiveness of HIV service provision still needs to be explored. So, and as word of conclusion, I think the question needs to be asked, what can be done about this situation? Well, the first thing I think is that academics and policy workers from across urbanization and public health arenas need to start becoming a lot more critically engaged with the support that a program such as PEPFAR is providing. And equally, although beyond the scope of this talk, other HIV AIDS and health organizations such as the Geneva-based Global Fund. From an urbanization perspective in particular, while there's long been interest in public health, communicable and non-communicable diseases as Warren has highlighted, and the relationships these have to urban environments and governance, there hasn't as yet been such sustained engagement and critical reflection, either on same-sex urban community health needs or the role of large-scale global donors such as PEPFAR in shaping the provision of services across cities. Second, this means within the Serena, we need to start thinking a lot more, both transversally across different minority communities and urban environments, and hierarchically in terms of metropolitan, provincial, national, and international processes. In particular, the role of the metropolitan and regional government in these processes needs to be further interrogated. It is at this scale, for example, that significant risks exist for government should PEPFAR funding be cut from NGOs. It is also at this scale that decisions are made as to whether NGOs are able to engage with the types of activities they have successfully bid for from PEPFAR. It therefore may well also be at this scale that pushback can effectively occur against some PEPFAR processes, such as those tied to its neoliberal framing, which can actually be detrimental to targeted communities in cities. In other words, the central place of the city, both as a spatial container that includes diverse same-sex communities with diverse needs, and as a governance structure deeply implicated in the operations of international processes, such as those located around PEPFAR, require clearer explication. Thanks. Thanks so much, Andy. And um, yeah, I think you know, really interesting to see these global dynamics playing out. I'm going to hand over straight to Anton and ask Anton if you would take us on a slightly different journey, um, moving away from health, um, but speak to your work in, in Ghana and Tanzania. Thanks. Thanks, Gareth. Um, and yes, we're going, to, we're going to depart from the health theme for a little bit now. I'm going to be speaking about um, two urbanization laboratories um, that we ran over a period of three years each. Um, one in Tanzania and one in Ghana. Um, before I do that, I should, I should probably check maybe from you, Gareth, um, that my audio is okay. Um, yes, one of the, I, can hear, I can hear you uh, fine. One of, the, one of the great uh, geopolitical power plays that I'm exposed to every morning is the one that determines who gets the functional set of headphones. I think I was already outsmarted this morning. So we're sitting with slightly deaf technology, but I'm glad that you can hear. So thanks. So the, the overarching theme for my talk is, um, is national urban policy. And I'm gonna focus on two urbanization labs and how they were able to, to use the, national, the, the space created by national urban policy to appropriate two powerful, I would argue powerful global tropes, one around climate change and decarbonization. Uh, and that was particularly in the case of Ghana. And the other was around industrialization and green industrialization. And that was really um, the global trope that Tanzania tried to, try to latch onto to advance its own needs. But, but the frame that en enabled all of this was the one of national urban policy, which was, it's been around for a long time, as you know, um, but was kind of brought, brought back into, into the remit um, by the work, more recent work um, around 2010, 2011, of OECD, UN Habitat, and then Cities Alliance, who actually um, went around a number of um, African countries 
developing national urban policies for, for, for those countries. And of course, it's important to recognize up front that there's something of, a, of an oxymoron embedded in the idea of a national urban policy. This idea that, um, that, that the complexity and the nuance, I suppose, uh, that we celebrate in cities and can somehow be curated um, from and, and by a central government um, is, of course, something that, that has been particularly kind of brought into contrast by these new networks, C40, many of which have been mentioned, C40, ICLE, UCLG, Africa, and indeed the Coalition for Urban Transitions um, that who we were working for when we, when we did this lab work. And, and these networks have really tried to make the case that cities can uh, make huge progress often on their own um, in terms of advancing uh, the sustainable development goals. And that's led to something that's really been referenced, which is sort of the rise of the mayor, right? As, as very powerful players um, in, in the context of SDGs. Um, for me personally, I think a more logical point of departure and one that uh, in Africa certainly um, holds up to scrutiny better is the idea that all cities are actually better off with supportive um, and enabling national governments. Right? That they, of course, there's an important role that cities could and should be playing on their own, but that enabling national government um, is in everyone's interest. And if you accept that, then of course, multi-level governance and, and the role of, um, of national urban policies becomes important again. And it, will, and it becomes particularly important in the African context, uh, given what everyone on this call, I think, knows um, that you know, many countries on the continent are urbanizing uh, at a rapid rate at quite low levels of per capita income um, and, uh, and quite late, in, in kind of it's the last continent, I suppose, to, to be undergoing its, its urbanization phase. And on top of that, something that's already been mentioned that um, many people are moving to cities that actually have, I don't know if they're weak senses of local government, but certainly local government that doesn't have the fiscal power and the decision-making and regulate legislative power that is often assumed um, by, by global tropes on sustainability, uh, industrialization and, and climate change um, when talking about cities. Right? So this, this idea of, of um, different and, and perhaps uh, less capacity and, and weaker local government, I think is really important. And of course that brings back into play, um, again, the, the, role of, um, the role of central government in, in trying to either support cities or, or do the work on behalf of cities. Because I don't think that this local government situation is likely to change uh, very quickly, in spite of all the rhetoric around um, decentralization and, and devolution. And why, why I say that is because I think very rationally, many, many central governments are wary of the potential of cities um, to incubate political opposition. Um, and of course, it's, it's kind of hubris to think that they can somehow prevent that happening, but it, still breeds a, a general reluctance um, to hand over too much uh, budget and too much decision-making power to, to local authorities for political reasons. Okay, so that's the, that's the preamble. And if you accept that, then, then um, uh, the question is um, how you go about taking all that, all that context and, and Geshe, I think, mentioned the importance of context and when, as we were charged with the responsibility of developing national urban policy in Tanzania and Ghana, like what do you actually do, right? And, and uh, there are various definitions of national urban policy out there, but the one that I kind of like to work with most is that, you know, this is really about who is responsible for what and with what budget and resources in what is necessarily a multi-actor process of, of, of urban development. And multi-actor includes state-owned entities, the utilities, national, regional, and local government, the private sector, um, very importantly, civil society, and, and of course, traditional authorities. And you know, they, they've all got a role to play. I think we, you ignore one at your, at your peril. I think we've seen bits of this um, playing out in Tanzania um, in the last year. And so if they really work, uh, NAPS can help cohere who does what and with what resources um, in, in this process. And, and I would argue that's a very important process. So this was, this was the understanding that we brought to Tanzania and Ghana. And of course, um, these are two completely different countries and cities, but I suppose they have some things in common. Um, 
Amongst those are the fact that they both have a, a primary city, um, which is the engine of economic growth. Um, they both have industrial policy ambitions and, and flagship policies, which are sort of essential policy pieces. Um, they both have some climate ambition. And of course, they're both um, urbanizing uh, very, very fast, as Edgar points out in his presentation. Um, in terms of urban policy, they're, they're very different. Um, you know, Ghana was quick onto urban policy. I think uh, the, the urban constituency was crucial in driving the, the, the end of the colonial era. Tanzania, on the other hand, has always had a sort of a vacillating relationship with, with urban, urban policy um, and never really got around to doing the hard work, whereas Ghana was actually the first under the UN Habitat a Cities Alliance process was the first country to have a, a national urban policy back in 2012. So the context is uh, messy and complicated to, to use uh, Getty's term and, and somewhat perplexing. And um, I think it's fair to say that it's an instinct within the African Center for Cities that when you, when you aren't quite sure what to make of a local context and you're not quite sure how to proceed, um, you set up an urbanization laboratory. That's, that's a little bit, uh, a little bit unfair, I think, on ourselves. Um, but we, it is what I'm about to describe is something that I hope you'll recognize as being part of the DNA of, of what um, ACC has tried to do almost since, since its inception. And I'm going to focus in on the, on the Tanzanian Urbanization Laboratory, what became known as the Two Lab, um, just for the sake of time. So basically what, what we did uh, in Tanzania in trying to work on national urban policy is that we uh, convened a group which ended up being 40 to 60 people and we actually had to cap it um, because it became popular as the momentum built. Uh, and we ended up um, having 15 sittings uh, of, of this community. And what, basically what they did um, is commission four background papers and we can talk about the content of those but they were each addressed very specific and I think interesting and slightly unusual research questions around political power, around the role of informality and things like that. Um, and we, com we commissioned those papers. Um, we peer reviewed them each at three times uh, at, at three different phases. Uh, and then we, and when I say peer review, that sounds very dry, but we basically deliberated them and we, you know, um, uh, we tore them apart and we, we helped the researchers doing the work, I think, in producing a, a better work. And then we try to plug that conversation back into the ongoing policy cycle, which is kind of rolling out with its regular mechanisms. In Tanzania at the time, and that was particularly the five-year plan. I mean, what we did, um, you know, there, there are various and people on this call are more than familiar with this kind of fancy terms. It's, it was co-production, it was interdisciplinary, it was the hive mindset, it was epistemic communities, it was social innovation, social learning, public innovation, triple helix. You can go on, and I think it's fair to say that we evoked all of those terms at different times and different audiences, somewhat opportunistically. I'm not sure we did any of them. Uh, definitively or particularly well. Um, but, but it kind of worked. Um, I think I feel confident in saying that it kind of worked in fostering a, a conversation. And, and why it worked, I think, is that when you actually had to do this, of course, the fancy words and the, and the titles uh, fall away. And so, I mean, my, my personal reflection on, on the Tanzanian urbanized, Urbanization Laboratory and what was good about it, and I, and I think there was a lot that was good about it, um, was first of all that um, it was given time, so it used a, a full three-year period. And it, um, uh, I think Yeshi said, you know, uh, we have to evoke imagination. Well, imagination takes time itself. It takes time to, to conjure up and to, to land. Um, I think we were able to uh, transcend gov government shifts. So the responsibility for urban policy actually shifted from the Ministry of Planning to uh, the Ministry of Finance. And of course, having this, this community holding the space allowed us to very, in a very agile way, make, make that shift without, without any kind of major disruptions. We ended up using local researchers. And so that was really important because I think, yeah, as we all know, facts on their own very often aren't enough, particularly in these political spaces, as Warren was pointing out. It's who owns the facts. It's how people relate to the facts. It's who, how people uh, communicate the research, which is important. Um, and of course, very importantly, this is the Magafuli era in, in Tanzania. So this was, this was a contested space. It was a difficult space, particularly for a, for a foreign consultant coming to work in. And yet we were able to make it a, a relatively safe space as well, in spite of having the Bureau of Statistics sitting on every one of our meetings. We were able to build a solidarity amongst urbanists. And, and I think, um, you know, I don't want to oversell it and um, we can talk about the content of what emerged uh, in the 
you know, and then urban policy roadmap that we produced. But I think, and I feel confident about this, that we were able to flip the narrative a little bit at least from cities as a, as a kind of part of the problem to cities as, as a potentially part of the, part of the solution and, 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 a, and a great force. And that flip was something which happened over time. Um, it kind of percolated through this community. And I'd like to, like to believe anyway um, that it's something that is continues to be held by the 60, maybe 70 now odd people who participated in the process. And even though there is no slam dunk in terms of um, landing a national urban policy in, uh, you know, in, in Tanzania, we've already seen the fingerprints of what we were working on in all sorts of decisions um, or on all sorts of decisions that have already been taken. And I think that's been a positive process. Thanks very much, Ali. Thanks so much, Anton. I'm going to hand over straight to Liza. Um, and yeah, it's a pleasure to just close out this group of inputs. And if anyone can put their questions in the chat, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Gareth. I really appreciate that. Can everybody hear me? Can you just give me the thumbs up? Gareth, I've lost you. Can I get a thumbs up that you can hear me? All right, great. So it's always slightly anxiety inducing to go last when I know that everybody wants to actually ask each other questions. So what I'm going to try to do is and focus on some of the really core arguments that I want to make. And I have a slightly longer piece, which I can share with people if they're interested that I've written for this. So I'm going to wrap us back to the original question, which was actually on the call, which is that cities and African cities in particular need to engage with geopolitical processes. And what I think that we can see today in the presentations is that we can see that African cities are already engaging with multi-scalar, multi-territorial geopolitical processes that are playing out through lots and lots of different sectors in different ways and sometimes quite similar ways. So I would like to start from the proposition that African cities are already key sites of the exercise of geopolitical power, control, claim staking, configuration. Um, and I mean, this is obviously with a sort of expanded uh, kind of conceptualization of the geopolitical, but in any rate, we can see that things like finance, ideas, people are, are moving between the world, the worlding and the global and the local. So I'm going to focus in my talk quite quickly on the ways in which African cities are enrolled in and engaged with geopolitics from the perspective of urban infrastructure. I'd like to argue that my work and other scholars, Sylvia Cruz, Andrea Polio, Tom Goodfellow, John Silver, others have come to the argument that we can use urban infrastructure as a site to understand geopolitical and multi-scalar control. So something um, that might be important to think about here is that urban infrastructure in this sense is not just kind of conventional uh, municipal infrastructure, but it's also something like a pan-African highway project, which um, the trans-African highway, sorry, which has a pan-African orientation, but in fact shapes cities large and small as it lands in space. So Simone Becker makes the argument that uh, sort of urban infrastructure lens and particularly its geopolitics plays out in particular strength in capital cities. I think this can be seen in cities like Luanda and Addis, but my work in Kisumu, a smaller town in Kenya, actually suggests that even in smaller secondary cities, the geopolitical uh, infrastructural tussle is also quite apparent. Sometimes this is when mega projects come crashing through smaller jurisdictions, but it can also be by design if these smaller cities form part of natural resource catchment areas or um, other uh, regional and international configurations that position them as, as quite central. So it's both in cities large and small that we can see this playing out. Regardless from the colonial time until present, we can see the ways in which uh, different infrastructure systems have been enrolled in and enlisted in geopolitical battles from mobility infrastructure to energy provision. More recently, um, and this is work that Andrea Polio and others have been thinking about, the way in which undersea uh, and, and terrestrial uh, cables have been providing broadband to Africa's urban areas, as well as the pricing and taxing of this data, which we can see all sorts of geopolitical battles playing out, and also with effects for the sorts of digital political constituencies which can form in and between city contexts. So the digital is actually becoming a sort of new and hyper contested uh, domain and the example of, of Uganda's attacks on social media is a really good one there. So there's lots of different conjunctures which can help us make sense of how this process has evolved and why uh, urban infrastructure has become sort of hyper politicized in a worlded context. I would like to suggest that there's two things that we should really be looking at here. The first is the sort of fractured nature of the urban infrastructure network, and the section is the fractured nature of urban statecraft in the African context. So I'll start with the first one. 
African cities, for those on the call who haven't uh, engaged directly with empirical work on the continent, reflect a combination between on and off grid, large and small, formal and informal, networked and distributed systems of service delivery. So many people think that you know African cities might just be the sort of big glitzy mega projects that uh, Geshe spoke about, or the informal practices of the poor. Actually, it's a whole spectrum of engagements, and this is a very much reflects a palimpsest of, of epics of investment from the colonial settler extractive logic through to the um the sort of nation building projects of decolonization, followed by modernization driven by multilateral lenders. And today we see really this sort of African frontierism, which uh, has led lenders and donors to now scramble to invest in African cities, sometimes in search of profits, other times hoping for long term political alliances. Perhaps not surprisingly, these catalogs of investments are rarely attentive to First, the other investments being, investments being made by global and national players, and also to the sort of palimpsest of existing hybridized models of delivery. So new BRT networks are shoved onto existing minibus taxi systems, state-of-the-art sanitation treatments is being laid over existing low-tech vacuum trucks and septic tanks. And these might be fine if these new investments are interoperable with existing systems and if debt conditions are favorable for African cities and regions. However, this is rarely the case. This material fragmentation is then overlaid with an institutional fracturing. Um, the, this is really important because it brings us to the question of urban statecraft and what the urban state actually means in the African context. Here I'd like to suggest that the municipality or the local government isn't actually the urban state in Africa. And what is the urban state is actually a set of relationships which form among different agencies and territorialities and in relationship to infrastructure. To trace this back briefly, we have to look at the process of partial decentralization, which has been undertaken in the African context, again, a sort of palimpsest of institutional reform since the 1980s. What is important here to remember is that the political dimension of decentralization has often been foregrounded, where actually the fiscal, where money actually flows, has been under discussed in the African context. What, what we can see here is that actually the majority of investment in urban context is driven by national governments, not by subnational governments, or even by the private sector. This is driven by ring fenced agencies, utility companies, a whole range of different actors. What this means is that, again, that the urban state is given effect in and through the relationships between actors rather than by a municipality itself. In conclusion, I'd like to suggest um, not only that this sort of uh, fiscal structuring and material fragmentation has been driven by historical and current geopolitics, but also that these arrangements are themselves geopolitical. They reflect discourses, adjustments, demands, incentives of actors, both of the world and locally. This geopolitical fragmentation has some pretty serious implications for this first call that I spoke about to bring African cities into geopolitical processes. If cities are neither material, single material entities nor governed in ways that are legible and conscripted, how do they in all of their material and institutional messiness engage in these emerging fora? And this is the question that I'd like to leave you with is that if we have cities that are this sort of complex, multi-layered, overlapping, uh, material and institutional entities, what does that mean to ask them to speak into international processes that are that actually have quite a quite a lot of um, controls and regulations on what sorts of institutions get to be a part of them. So I'll lend you I'll end there and uh, turn it back to Gareth to facilitate questions. Thanks so much, Liza, and thanks for helping me make up a little bit of time. Um, yeah, I, I'd I'd like to open the floor now. I think we did say that we are given some of the time constraints uh, and being aware of sort of having only 15 minutes left. Uh, I thought I'd open the floor to the wider audience rather than have conversations. And if any of the presenters from the last session want to pose questions of others, please do. But let me open up the floor and see if there are any questions that anyone would like to ask. Um, and yeah, just uh, let's have some of that conversation and let's see. Uh, open it up and see if any have any questions and if you do have questions please direct them to the speaker and if you want to put them in the chat I haven't noted any presentation uh, any questions in the chat as yet but yeah so if there are any questions I always find these moments of silence quite awkward but Keep silent. Oh, here comes a question. 
see if there is one coming through. Warren? Yeah, please go ahead, Warren. Um, yeah, just to say I found Liza's presentation fascinating. And, and I think Kenya is a, such an excellent example of how these geopolit these global geopolitical political processes play out at the national scale. Like there was a famous example where the international development funding agencies kind of carved up Kenya into like different spheres of interest with different agencies funding different parts of Kenya, like the French Development Agency ended up with, with Kasumu, for example. And then also then you had the World Bank making decisions like around the, that highway that runs from Mombasa through Nairobi and Kasumu to, to Rwanda, which kind of had an enormous impact on, on Kasumu. But yeah, it was totally the decisions were being made in, in New York and Paris and not really in, in Kasumu. Thanks, Warren. I think maybe just building on that, I, I, I mean, for me, the point, again, that Liza made, but I think it resonated in a number of the other presentations was this question of institutional fracturing that played out in this sort of partial decentralization and how these relationships build. So the relationships with those international donor agencies, how those form, how, in Andy's discussion, how those relationships might break down when there's a particular um, mode of governance or a particular mode of sort of managerial mode that gets imposed on those and fractures those relationships and and in so doing sort of undermines some of those relationships and and how process that Anton described is able to sort of bring together emerging of these different relationships and how of consensus but an agreement on a particular way forward can be re reached if they, even if there isn't consensus I, I mean for me what what also emerged in, in, in these discussions and the kind of discussion around a wider national urban strategy that, that Anton mentioned, but you were also mentioning the two, uh, this issue and making reference to Kasumu and some of the work that I know others on the call at Mercy and others are interested in at the moment is the role that secondary cities are now playing, not just the city regions and these global regions that Edgar mentioned, but these secondary cities and where are these cities places where other forms of sort of discovery and creation, are they better suited to surf that complexity than others? Perhaps not if they having these impositions from above from these global organizations, but what that might play out. But anyway, those are just some thoughts. Back to you, Liza. Uh, yeah, I'd like, to pick, I'd like to pick up on that exactly. I think that we need considerably more research and a much deeper understanding of what the logics are that are driving different uh, donors and lenders on the continent, right? And so we, for some, we have a sort of a bit of an understanding of what the, how they assess a project, how they assess a region, what makes them decide to engage in a particular way with a place, and what that then means for the infrastructural outcomes that, that get put onto the ground. But for, for many, we, we remain kind of uh, confused about what, for example, the long-term implications, political, geopolitical implications of something like Addis's light rail might mean for uh, the relationship between, between China and, and the Ethiopian government. So I think we need a lot deeper of an understanding about how different lenders and donors have different logics of engagement uh, with infrastructure at, at, in African cities. Thanks, Liza. Andy? Yeah, Liza, I mean, I think that's that's absolutely key. And it also like circles back perfectly to, to, to Geshe's point um, earlier with regard to the particular metrics and logics that are used. Sometimes it's more important that things look transparent and that governance is followed rather than actual activities um, are beneficial to particular communities. I mean, obviously, from within an, uh, you know, a, a, a southern urbanism frame, there's so much debate about that connection between how exactly southern knowledge is, southern scholarship can speak back to the global north. But I think that within an urban development frame or wider development frame, the actual complexity of being able to do that when there are so many competing agendas, um, it is significantly problematic. We can see this recently, as I'm sure many people on this call are aware, with the recent cuts that the UK government has made to um, funding for development work and research in the global south, partly, partly because of COVID and partly because of the intricacies of the British government. But what I think is fascinating there is just the kind of sporadic and almost ad hoc nature by which decisions do get made and how as much as we talk about exploring logics and rationales for decisions, sometimes it almost appears that there are no logics or rationales, that, it is, that 
that these things that we see as concrete and important in terms of how we move forward with development are actually deeply ephemeral. And that might also be something that we need to think th through more in terms of how we understand risk and responsibility. Thanks, Andy. Um, Anton, I see your hand is raised. Oh, hi. Um, thanks. I, I, I got a lot from, from those talks. And I suppose one of the intriguing things is how, how so much of this power is kind of hidden right, or, or um, embedded and not scrutinized precisely, Andy. Um, which just comes with the package, right? And I think very often the people working there haven't actually done that hard work and scrutineering their own logics, right? Liza, to use your term. And then what's so interesting about working on this continent is how, how that same logic, even though it's not explicit, gets assimilated right? by NGOs, by civil societies, very often, you know, um, because, that's, because it comes with a budget to do the work. And so this transfer of logics, this transfer of hidden power, I think is, is a crucial theme that, um, is, you know, and especially for those of us who work at the kind of implementation end of, of, of this um, is crucial because it's, it's, it's very, very seldom on the table, right? And yet it, and yet it becomes hugely influential. And back to this, this morning, earlier on, you know, why BRTs? Like, well, why, why do they gain traction? You know? Because I would argue because people haven't really peeled back the layers of what's behind the, the thinking of a BRT, for example, um, to get you. So I think that's, that's crucial to, to do the hard work on that stuff. Thanks, Anton. And just taking on that sort of question of assimilation and referring to Geshe's kind of positioning of decolonization and the kind of kind of that imprint and how that kind of gets transferred across and yeah, um, how that might play out. But I, Anton, I wanted to ask a question just to delve a little bit deeper in, from you in, in how working on the urban transitions work in these particular contexts, particularly in the Tanzanian context, where the nation state is particular power, particularly powerful and influenced by these geopolitics, but how that relationship with how the urban was then framed, maybe just to elaborate a little bit on those intricacies and how the urban was able to, perhaps as I understood, and as I, having read some of the work, how that's able to sort of claim some agency in these global spaces and sort of assert itself differently. And maybe just to elaborate on that just briefly, uh, and allow others also just to ask others to pose any questions as well. Liza, you might also have some inputs on that specifically as well. So, I mean, I think what, what, is, what was not contested was the, the scale of the demographic shift. Right? I mean, some of the numbers are contested by central government, but it was self-evident right, that people were moving into cities and that fertility rates were higher in cities. But Dar es Salaam is an intriguing city um, to the extent that the numbers are right, because probably one of the only capitals in the world where infant mortality and life expectancy at birth is lower than the national average. Um, and so the, the hidden assumption very often was that the solution to that was to send people, to request that people go back to the rural areas. Um, and that obviously had a whole political kind of uh, package with it because it's much easier to, to govern people in, Tan in Tanzania, especially um, in, in rural areas and in urban areas. Um, and there's a disproportionate representation in cabinet. Um, I think you need 20 rural votes to get one seat uh, in parliament versus 200 uh, rural votes in, in the urban areas. So, you know, that's, that's part of this hidden power that I'm talking about. Um, what, what the group was able to do, right? And this was a collective effort which kind of emerged. And that's, that's the point about the laboratory is you don't have to kind of try and land big facts. You can let stuff emerge organically. And I think that's a much more powerful way of of trying to flip a narrative, what the group was kind of came around to was that urbanization was going to happen regardless of policy, right? And that not co-opting the moment, right? The urbanization moment would be political suicide. So it was never said like that, obviously, because the politics again was sort of hidden in the technocratic work that we were doing. But I think that that, that was landed as that, that penny dropped. And then that made a, a, whole, a whole of other work easier that, that you politically you, you ignore cities uh, at your peril and that actually it's much, much, much too expensive to try and manage cities by persuading people to go back to rural areas. And I think that once that had landed, all sorts of gaps and opportunities opened up for us. Thanks, Anton. Liza, you, you turned on your camera just to see if there was a question. You're right. Warren, in, see, here, sorry. There is a question in the chat, so 
I'm going to pose that before I move to you, Warren, uh, if there's anything. And then we'll just ask this question, then I'll hand over to Andy to close out. How can African urbanists and, and cities and, and nation states drive an agenda input at the global level? How can we create programs and initiatives that are locally driven yet get globally funded from Nangalo uh, Saki to everyone? So, yeah, any, any thoughts on that? Liza, I see you came up. I'll come in on the second part is that I think, I mean, I would argue that as it currently stands, we do have lots of programs that are that are locally driven and globally funded. Uh, it's just that that relationship is not necessarily explicit. And I would say that it, taking a look at Tom Goodfellow's new work on, on Chinese-ness and African cities, uh, there's a lot of thinking about the way in which things that appear to be global and um, homogenous, in fact, are very much uh, locally engineered to meet the needs of particular nations and particular cities. So I think cities are actually quite used to the idea that they must fit themselves into a global narrative to attract that funding. But once it lands, there's absolutely no way that the agency of place doesn't, doesn't have um, some sort of uh, relationship with that. And so I think that there's constantly a, a, a dialogue between the, the homogenizing nature or the sort of policy mobility uh, and, and institutional monocropping that the international sphere uh, imposes and the way in which there's pushback against that at the local level. So yeah, I would say that cities need to find more and more in, uh, interesting ways to, to claim those, those agendas and have them land in, thought, in thoughtful ways. And, and funders also need to think about what it means to build in flexibility uh, into those programs. Thanks, Liza. Perhaps now, given the time that we are at, at time, I'm going to uh, call it close there. And thank you to the presenters now from the, this past session. And and then just note some of the thanks that are appearing in the chat as well. But to you, Andy, uh, maybe ask if you can close and, uh, and wrap this up. Thanks. Thanks, Gareth. Thank you uh, for chairing that uh, really exciting and um, interesting session. Thank you to my colleagues at the ACC for offering such um, so it's valuable input as we try to unpack the complexity of these issues. Um, in the one minute we have left, I would simply just like to say and, and reflect on relation to this um, gathering compared to other great powers and urbanizations events. And just to say that I think that a series of, of somewhat distinct and important dynamics to previous sessions, I think have been surfaced here. Um, and as Liza said, there are multiple and complex ways in which cross-scale processes are already playing out um, and lots of different actors attempting to affect meaningful change, but that these really do emerge, uh, I think, out of the particular colonial and post-colonial histories um, of the continent. Um, and, I, and I suppose that just one final reflection is that um, this complexity not only needs to be engaged with, as I think many of the speakers um, today have highlighted, but that such engagement is both a creative, a co-productive, and a continually iterative process. Um, I think that one of the challenges that we've seen you know, very clearly is that these top-down interventions, these interventions that don't engage with place, that don't engage with history, um, are pretty much um, un unable to, uh, to affect meaningful change. And it's really the role of the scholar and the policy experts um, and the governance official um, in Africa to navigate these complexities in an iterative manner um, with the hope that more sustainable solutions will be generated in the future. Um, bearing in mind, it's now 2.30 a.m. where Ian is. I would just like um, to ask Ian if he'd like to comment briefly um, in relation to the upcoming sessions in the Great Powers and Urbanization Project. Uh, Andy, thank you, and thank you to everyone uh, who joined today. Um, and in particular, Andy, I want to thank you for drawing the, some of the differences between this session and some of the previous ones. I think that yeah, you're right. We have previously thought about um, whether it be uh, uh, the um, competition between cities and nation states in the context of shifting geopolitics, or in fact, complementary roles as it comes to um, multi-level governance. Uh, between cities and regions and national governments uh, it, amid shifting geopolitics, but the, the conversation today around um, collaboration, co-production, um, and iteration, I think, uh, certainly uh, problematized some of the stuff we've done before, but also moved uh, moved the conversation in an exciting new direction. And that new direction next is, uh, thanks, Andy, it, Melbourne. 
on um, June the 3rd, um, Michaela Kuto and Daniel Paycheck, who, who were both here today, um, will be hosting that gathering and we'll be asking some similar questions, um, but in the context of uh, East Asia and the South Pacific. Um, and then after that, uh, everyone is welcome at all of these, of course, um, we'll be moving on to Chicago where the question will be what um, the so-called new Cold War between the US and China means for urban development um, globally, a rather large one that will take on questions uh, specifically around infrastructure and urban design and planning. Um, so uh, thank you for, for supporting these conversations today um, and, and hopefully uh, you get to hear more from us in the future. Let me also just mention very quickly that the proceedings from the Penn event um, and the um, CDOP event in Barcelona are available on their websites. Summaries were produced um, there's a video of the one uh, of the, the workshop from Kari in Buenos Aires. And there is up on uh, the platform called the Diplomatic Career an ongoing selection of essays from all participants in these sessions uh, on, the, on the questions that they found inspiring and wanted to take up and write further. So you can, I refer you to that site as well. Thank you very much. And with that, we'll draw the event to a close. Thank you, Ian. Um, thank you, all the presenters. Uh, thank you for all the comments. Um, have a good rest of the day or rest of the night where you are. Thank you.